Chamber and uh, the first order of business. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine Began Flood, who's sitting beside me here, and she's uh, legal counsel for the for the committee. Um, and also, there is a fair amount of uh, information that you will find before you, and I don't know whether Will you would like to. Uh, yeah, I can if you want. Just, do you want to do the subcommittee reports first, or do you? Okay, want we'll do the subcommittee reports first, and then uh, and then Will will just point out what you've all the pile of paper you have before you. So, Liz, did you want to move one of the two subcommittee Yeah, reports? I'll start with the uh, first one, which is dated uh, March Thursday, March 29th. Right. So, um, your subcommittee met on Thursday, March 29th, 2012, to consider the method of proceeding on the 2012 special report of the Office of the Auditor General on Orange Air Ambulance and Related Services and recommends the following. One, that witnesses be scheduled in 30-minute time slots on Wednesday, April 4th, 2012. Two, that the Honorable Michael Gravel, Minister of Natural Resources, be removed from the witness list. Three, that the committee clerk contact the Deputy Minister of Education to let the ministry know they will no longer be scheduled for Wednesday, April 25th. That the committee, and four, that the committee clerk in consultation with the chair be authorized prior to the adoption of the report of the subcommittee to commence making any preliminary arrangements necessary to facilitate the committee's proceedings. And I'll stop here and then we'll vote on this and then deal with the other one. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Carried. Carried. Okay, and thank you. Get to the one you and the uh, April 3rd? Okay, the second report. Your subcommittee met on Tuesday, April 3rd, 2012, to consider the method of proceeding on the 2012 special report of the Officer of the Auditor General on Orange Air Ambulance and Related Services and recommends the following. One, that a letter be sent to all witnesses outlining the procedures, powers, privileges, and witness protections afforded to those who may appear before the Public Accounts Committee. Two, that legal counsel be present at all hearings on the 2012 special report of the Office of the Auditor General on Orange Air Ambulance and Related Services. Three, that legal counsel provides advice as may be required by the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Four, that legal counsel distribute a letter to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts listing the potential areas where they could be of assistance during the hearings and five, that the committee clerk in consultation with the chair be authorized prior to the adoption of the report of the subcommittee to commence making any preliminary arrangements necessary to facilitate the committee's proceedings. Okay. All in favor? You want to speak? No, Carrie. Chair, Chair. Yes. Um, I want to speak to item number three on the subcommittee report before we vote on it. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, thank you. Um, before we begin, Chair, I wonder if you might introduce um, uh, the uh, committee's counsel. So some of us have not met her. Okay. Yet. That, yes? Were you not here at the beginning of the meeting? I just, uh, yeah, just, yeah. Oh, no, I guess I was down the hall. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. This is Catherine Bagan Flood, uh, who is counsel for the, for the committee. All right. Thank you. I do want to speak for a few minutes, uh, not on. Um, uh, the only thing I'd say is. Uh, before you start, uh, Mr. Zimmer, is if, if I'm happy to have you speak, but I'd like to keep things on schedule as well, so yeah. for the for the benefit of those that are here before us. I, d I don't expect I'll be more than five minutes. Okay, okay? and let me say at the outset that I don't want to. I'm not going to speak to any <clears throat> uh, substantive uh, issues before the committee. That is substantive issues uh, as to what went on or didn't go on in the in the orange scenario. I, w I do want to speak to, and I particularly want to address my uh, uh, remarks to uh, the inquiries uh, council. And I do want to speak then about um, matters of uh, process, uh, the pro processes of this committee, uh, and in particular uh, council's role uh, at this committee. Let me start uh, my remarks by, and I, and I won't be more than five minutes. Um, of course, this inquiry raises uh, very, very complex um, legal issues, issues surrounding what went on or didn't go on at uh, Orange, 
it raises complex uh, uh, legal issues because uh, some of uh, some witnesses before the committee, non-MPPs, are under oath. Uh, there is a parallel criminal investigation being conducted by the OPP. Uh, we have no knowledge of uh, what's going on in that investigation or indeed where that's going to take us or who they're speaking to or not speaking to. There is the, uh, I expect in all probability, the likelihood of some complicated uh, civil proceeding litigations that may flow at the, when this is all over out of what went on or didn't go on at Orange. So uh, my questions and the issues that I want to raise are n substantial uh, about process and particularly council's role. Uh, in my view, the role of council is to uh, advise the committee, uh, give it the council's best possible advice uh, on an independent, nonpartisan basis. Uh, council, in my view, advises the uh, chair, takes questions from the chair, uh, offers guidance when asked and when not asked of the chair and of the clerk of the committee, and indeed is available to member, all members of the committee, be they liberal, conservative, or NDP, in how they can fulfill their duties and responsibilities. S the um, of particular concern is um, matters that may come before this inquiry and how those matters, um, depending on what this committee does with them or does not do with them, affects uh, or may affect uh, proceedings in the independent criminal investigation, uh, potential uh, civil proceedings dealing with the complex issues uh, that we're dealing with here. And so um, I have um, these uh, uh, questions that I'd just like to raise with council, about four or five of them, and perhaps uh, she can assist us with them, or the chair or the clerk. Um, I think we have to clearly understand, as members of this committee, uh, the clerk and the, and the chair, um, the, the role of council and, and, council's, um, and council's mandate. I can tell you that, um, um, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chair or Mr. Clerk or Madam Council, that I understand you've been um, recently retained. I, I, that's what I'm advised in the last few days or week or so. Is that? That's correct. Is that and, correct? And the, and the council has met with the subcommittee. Yes. And the council has provided uh, information on which you have before you on uh, how she thinks she can assist. Okay. And I think many of the points you make are th the reason that we have retained council. All right. So this issue so came up about the about council's role and uh, how, how council would um, uh, fulfill that role in two previous inquiries um, uh, before st uh, standing committees. One was the, um, the uh, inquiry, uh, night, August 1994, uh, special, uh, the Standing uh, Committee on the Legislative Assembly, and um, the members of the committee there, uh, um, uh, MPP Callahan, Shirelli, Hanson, Harnick, Johnson, Marchese, Matheson, Murf Murphy, Winnegar, and Sutherland, Lisa Freeman was the clerk of the committee. Now, here's the important point. There were two counsels to the committee. Eleanor Cronk, who, at Faskin and Calvin, a senior counsel, and a junior counsel, William Horrigan, uh, also at the, at the same firm. As you know, counsel uh, uh, Eleanor Cronk was a distinguished lawyer who went on and now sits on the Ontario Court of Appeal. And uh, in that inquiry, at page... Uh, to the point. Uh, we have witnesses here. We have business to conduct. Yes, uh, you I haven't made a okay. point yet, and it's right. been 10 I minutes. appreciate that, Chair, but the, you know, the role of council and what this committee has to do, we've got to get it right, because if we get it wrong, there are independent criminal investigations out there. There is complex civil litigation I expect to be pending, and what we do here, if we don't get it right, may, may compromise the independent criminal investigation and the work of the civil proceedings. So for the investment of 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes, to ensure that we get it right is the right way to proceed. In the two previous inquiries, 
they spent some several days sorting out the role of uh, counsel. I've got the transcripts here. I've asked the clerk to distribute the transcripts. You can see what then counsel Eleanor Cronk, now Justice of the Court of Appeal, advised the committee as to what she thought the role of uh, committee counsel was. Similarly, with respect to the inquiry that was done by the Standing Committee on uh, the Legislative Assembly um, uh, dealing with um, Shelley Martell. There's another, two distinguished counsels on that committee were Patricia Jackson at Tory Tory, Larry Taman, who went on distinguished role in government as counsel of that committee. He spent several pages and they spent uh, several half days, I think, of the subcommittee sorting out what the role of counsel was to the committee. I think it's very, very important that counsel have the, the benefit of at least reviewing, and I've distributed the pages, there are four or five pages, I think, of that discussion, of that counsel's role, or uh, thoughts on how the committee should uh, receive the advice of, of counsel. And I say that, I yes, thought Mr. this was Please. so important. He should have brought this to our attention days ago when he had the opportunity to do so. None of us have an opportunity to review anything that you're bringing forward here today before we hear from, uh, from uh, witnesses. I'm suggesting to you, Mr. Zimmer, that what you're trying to do is simply rag the puck. We have witnesses here. We need to get to the business of what we're here to do. Table the information. I agree. We'll We're here it. to get about about oh, the, this, uh, about. Yes, the, yes, Ms. Sanders. I did bring this information to the subcommittee yesterday, and the subcommittee didn't want to discuss it any further, which is why we have a very vague clause number three in the committee report. So, I'm sorry, but the process is when we have a committee's report that where there's one clause under contention, this is our only opportunity to discuss it. No, well, Mr. Cleese, I've taken the, uh, I, in anticipation of, uh, of your objection, I've done the research. I've, I've, my objection. Yes, yeah, so I did the research last night. I've got about six okay. questions that I distilled from the two transcripts uh, of the two previous inquiries where those very, very distinguished counsels recognized the, 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 um, the dangers of not getting this right. We have people who have been, are coming here under oath. Uh, they're entitled to be treated fairly, uh, to protect their rights. Uh, council members, uh, or inquiry members, whether on the opposition side or this side, are entitled to know uh, w what advice they can call on from council and the like. For a 10-minute investment, Mr. Cleese, to get it right, how would you like Mr. if we mess this up and later on in a court proceeding, either civilly or criminally, there were rulings that because certain things were said or done or permitted to inquire here at this level, it jeopardized those proceedings. So let me just give you please get uh, the these. Point, Mr. Okay, here's... Yeah, well, please, well, if you stopped Mr. interrupting please, me, I could get please, through Madam, it, Mr. Cleese. Make his point. I think this is important. Make your point, please. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a distillation of what you will find in here, Madam Counsel. Um, uh, to, uh, to what extent have you been briefed on the subject matters of these hearings? This is a, you know, there are hundreds of millions of dollars at stake here. Complex corporate reorganizations, I, I've expected that you've at least seen the corporate structure of Orange and, and all of that. Um, most councils um, preparing for a complex hearing like this do need time to really adequately and sufficiently prepare so they can deal with matters as they come before this committee from witnesses, the chair, the clerk, or committee members. Uh, I want to clear under, uh, uh, the other counsels spent some time sorting out their, their role as independent uh, counsel. Uh, is it your role to determine whether witnesses are able to bring counsel with them to these hearings? And if so, what the role of witnesses counsel would be? Has thought been given to that? A lot of attention was paid to that in the transcripts. Have you made a determination at this point as to the rights of witnesses to attend with counsel uh, and what role counsel can play? Another question that came up, considering that this committee has determined that all witnesses will be required to swear an oath, uh, what's your view and what's your advice on determining at the outset 
whether in fact the witnesses have right to counsel, whether they should be advised of their right to counsel, what priority and how would counsel go about protecting the rights of witnesses if they appear here without counsel? A uh, number of our committee, our committee members have indicated the OPP investigation has to be the highest priority. So um, have you had an opportunity to assess with the OPP what the scope of their investigation is and how you will deal with matters should the OPP in this in criminal investigation raise an issue that uh, uh, we ought not to go in that area or we should go in that area because it may jeopardize wh what they're doing. Uh, is your role as uh, committee counsel to advise members of the appropriateness of their questions having regard to the scope of the OPP investigation and the likelihood of civil proceedings subsequent to this hearing? Uh, have you made a determination as to what types of questions members should avoid, avoid asking witnesses um, to not jeopardize the OPP investigation and likely civil proceedings? And lastly, there's going to be a large number of documents and a lot of testimony that amounts to matters that uh, may or may not be subject to privilege or are protected by freedom of information. Is it your role to advise committee members um, as to the... Um, as to how they should proceed in that regard. So at first blush, this seems like a, just a, a relatively simple I inquiry. We're going to be here, we're going to ask some questions at Orange. But there are enormous consequences, as I've, as I've laid out. And I think I want uh, to ask Council, I want to be assured, the Council has essentially had adequate time to prepare in detail for her role in this committee. Uh, and that she's had adequate time and can provide answers for uh, those questions I've asked about how she will um, um, advise participants in, in this hearing. I raise these questions both as an MPP and I raise these questions both as an officer of the court because I'm a barrister and a solicitor and I have an obligation uh, to speak to these matters um, both uh, at that level as a counsel and as an officer of the court, as obviously you do counsel. Thank you. So thank you for that, Mr. Zimmer. Um, I'll ask uh, our counsel if, uh, obviously you just gave many, many questions, whether she wants to respond a bit to it, uh, but I would think that uh, if she wants more time, having you having just given all those questions, yeah. uh, we can consider taking a recess as well. Do you want to respond? To Kathy? Yeah, Kathy? absolutely. And, then, and I asked my I asked my questions in all in the best sense of the word and in the interest of having a, a properly conducted hearing. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate those questions. Um, I, I think that you'll find there there is a, a privileged a solicitor client privileged memorandum that has been distributed to all members of the committee that addresses some of the questions that you've asked. Um, there's also a letter that has been provided to witnesses, including witnesses scheduled for today, which also answers a number of the questions that you've asked. Um, in, 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 to give you, to address the, the other matters, uh, what I would recommend is that I provide to the committee another solicitor client and privileged memorandum to address the few ad additional issues um, that have come up in your questions today, or the, the committee could uh, could recess. Um, but certainly, you know, we've already addressed in a number of the issues you have, and in light of the meetings that I've previously had with the chair and with the and may I ask, uh, and would you Zimmer, be, those issues that I've raised Mr. are Zimmer. not specious? I'm sorry. The, the issues that I've raised are not specious issues. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that they're specious issues. No. Um, simply, many of these matters have been addressed already in, in the memorandum that's provided by the committee. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm a bit concerned about yeah. giving privileged advice in public. Ah, well, that raises things. So maybe we should have this discussion in camera. Uh, um, I okay. ask, well, we have counsel here. So seek counsel's yes. advice. That's why you've retained counsel, or the committee's retained counsel. Okay, we'll take a five minute recess to discuss this.
Okay, could I, uh, could I ask the committee to uh, decide on the subcommittee report to adopt that and then immediately after we shall go into closed session to uh, further discuss uh, the, the points raised by Mr. Zim. Yes. So if, if I, just to make sure I understand what we are agreeing to, that we'll agree to the subcommittee report that has um, item three in it, but then we will, go into which closed is session the to sort of vague uh, item three, or would it be better if we recessed, discuss what we need to discuss, and then possibly um, come up with, I, I guess what I'm looking for is where is the outcome in terms of ability to flesh out number three. Yes, okay, so that is another option. We could do it that way. I think I would prefer that because that gives us the option of fleshing out number three so that we have terms of reference when we come back from the in-camera session. So we're not going to we want to sort this out. So can we uh, yeah. please decide on the subcommittee report minus point three then, please? Yes, that would be quite acceptable. And yes, Mr. Please. So Chair, I just want to no, Mr. Zimmer. I think please, 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 Mr. Chair, it's very obvious what's going on here. Uh, you know, Mr. Zimmer came late to this meeting. Uh, there was there was information. There was information. No, eight thirty. Mr. Zimmer, I let you speak. Mr. Zimmer, Mr. I let you speak. Mr. Zimmer, let. Mr. Zimmer, please let Mr. Cleese speak. Mr. Zimmer, there was information at our desks that addressed most of the issues that you addressed in your delay tactic. What is going on here, Mr. Chair, is precisely the reason that we called for a select committee of the legislature where the appropriate framework could be worked out, where the terms of reference could be worked out, where all of the issues that Mr. Zimmer addressed could have been worked out before we got into this situation. We said from the very beginning that the Public Accounts Committee is not the forum to review and to investigate the matters before us. It was the government and Mr. Zimmer himself in debate on the select committee made the point that this is all we need. Now he comes here and he delays the hearing. We have uh, witnesses here who have come, who are prepared, have taken time out of their busy schedule to be here, and Mr. Zimmer shows up here to make the very arguments that we made in the legislature as to why we need a select committee of the legislature. This is an insult to the people who are here, and what I'd ask Mr. Zimmer to do is to go back in the recess and tell his premier that what is needed is a select committee. We're certainly prepared, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chair, to move that we defer these witnesses who have come here to a select committee so that we can get on and do this appropriately. But in the meantime, this is something that is an offense to this committee. And Mr. Chair, I would ask you to see through what Mr. Zimmer is doing and ensure that we can get on with the business of this committee. Thank you for your point, France. I mean, I have been on public account for a little while and we've had contentious issue come before public account. You'll all remember eHealth and we were able to continue to work together because we wanted to go to the bottom of this. Mr. Zimmer was there. Mrs. Sandals was there during those discussions. This sudden change of tactic is, is really unpleasant, is not productive, and it's like, I understand they want to change the channel to something else than talking about orange, I guess they don't want to talk about Orange, but this is what we're here to do. Uh, they have many, many times in the House talked about the power of the Public Accounts Committee, and most of this power comes from the fact that we all work together so that the good work of our auditor of getting value for money actually pans out to getting value for money for the people of Ontario. And out of a sudden, to have this taken off on a tangent of legalese talk is not serving this committee well. It is certainly not serving the, the witnesses that have come. 
I am ready to ask those witness questions. I have no fear that any of the questions that I'll be asking those people will run me or any of you into trouble. I say we move ahead with uh, what we had intention to do this morning. And if we need more clarification as to how we will use our legal counsel, we can get back together next week during recess and have an in-depth briefing with our lawyer. But the people that are here today have been given uh, uh, their responsibility. What does being under oath will mean? The rest of it, to me, is business as usual. I will be asking the same question of those witnesses that I have been asking every witness that has come to uh, public accounts before. And to, to sidetrack us, to recess, to make us basically not do our work is counterproductive to what we're here to do. We're here for the people of Ontario. We're here to make sure that they get value for money. There are people here today that have information that will help make lights and that will make sure that we get value for money for the people of Ontario. This entire circus disgusts me. Thank you, France. Uh, Liz? Yes, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me make it perfectly clear that there is nothing I would like to do more than to hear from Mr. Smitherman. I am absolutely delighted to hear from my friend, Mr. Smitherman. So, but there are two precedents in recent memory for a committee hiring legal counsel. This is very unusual. And in fact, it's got nothing to do with select committees. The Gigant Gigantus Inquiry was a st standing committee. The Martell Inquiry was a standing committee. It's got nothing to do with whether it's a standing committee or a select committee. And when you look at what happened in those previous cases, the subcommittee took the time to work out in more detail exactly what is the role of counsel and to present the subcommittee then made recommendations to the full committee which had the role of counsel fleshed out. We're just making it up as we're going along. And I did suggest yesterday that in fairness to the witnesses that were scheduled this morning that we should ask them to come back uh, in a couple of weeks or to rearrange the schedule or something because I didn't want this to happen. But when the other two parties said, no, we don't want to discuss the role of counsel in advance in detail, you leave us no option but to bring it to the floor of the committee. I would have been perfectly happy to work through this yesterday or to do a formal deferral of the witnesses. But it seems to me very strange that when we're dealing with a report where, with, with, of the auditor where everybody seems to be in agreement that one of the issues is did the performance agreement, was it thought out well enough in advance, now we're doing the terms of reference for a new enterprise where they thought out well enough in advance, we're doing exactly the same thing here. We're going down a new road we need to think out the terms of reference of legal counsel because it matters. I have never ever been on a standing committee where the witnesses were sworn and where the committee had counsel. That changes the game. We need to sort what out, what are the rules and what is the role of counsel. And I would note that yes, this appeared on our desk this morning, but from the point of view of the witness, the witness didn't get to read it until he was going out the door this morning and opened his email. So in fairness to the witnesses, we're also disadvantaging the witnesses if they don't have a chance to look at the implications of being sworn in advance. And I totally support the suggestion of the chair that we go in camera and sort it out. Uh, Mr. Barrett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I do have a, a motion that is before members of the committee. I do wish to have this motion considered before we go forward with our uh, witnesses. Uh, we, ha we have uh, business, obviously. We we'll get to that, but we're, we're at this point, we're still discussing point three of the subcommittee. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Mr. Zimmer. Just uh, pick up on something um, uh, NDP member uh, 
uh, Franchelli, and he said, look, you know, the Public Accounts Committee is, in fact, the place to do this exercise. But for the Public Accounts Committee, and this is the thrust of my submission, given all of the complexities that we have to deal with, what we have to do is get the ground rules right about how we go about this inquiry. One of the essential elements of those ground rules is council's role. For instance, has council had a chance to read in detail and consider in detail the some close to 250 page, 200 page uh, performance agreement, which is gonna be essential to this thing? Has council had a chance to consider in the transcript from the Gigante inquiry there are 14 uh, single-spaced pages of uh, advice and, and sort of decisions about how uh, council commission or council uh, um, inquiry council Eleanor Cronk was going to proceed. Similarly, in the Martell thing, I think that it behooves all of us to take the benefit of that advice, go and sort out the ground rules, and then proceed so we can really dig into this in a fair way, Mr. without Jack jeopardizing Jack other inquiries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, with respect to uh, the role of council, um, it's very confusing or disturbing to me that uh, if we didn't have council here today, if we hadn't have hired council, we would have gone on with our inquiry, asked the questions as we did on the first day of this, of this uh, committee when we had witnesses, and proceeded uh, as normal. And the addition of having council who is, I think it should be very, very clear, council has one role and one role only to assist this committee in finding the truth. I mean, the committee's purpose is to search for the truth, to uncover what happened, to assess value uh, for the money that was put out by Ontarians, by the taxpayers. That's it. Uh, there's no complexity to that. We are here to find the truth. That's of paramount concern. And as a secondary concern, Council can advise us if an issue arises, and then that's the purpose of it. To, to suggest that having council will delay the truth searching concept of this committee is very disturbing and very concerning that uh, Mr. Zimmer would raise that issue. There is no issue here. Uh, we have witnesses, we'll hear from them. If a legal issue arises, we have council we can ask questions of. That's it. There's nothing more complicated than that. Um, and, and the notion that having council would delay this hearing is so counterproductive and so uh, contrary to, to common sense, it, uh, it uh, defies belief. I don't understand that at all. Yes, Mr. Mr. Cleese. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I think we all see what's happening here. I would like to make a motion uh, that we dismiss counsel. Uh, we don't need counsel. What we need to do is get to the truth and move on. And I would like to make a formal motion that we dismiss counsel and that we retain her for the select committee when the government agrees to strike that. That is my motion. So we, need that in writing. So we, we would need that in writing, Mr. I'll put Please. it in writing. Normally, uh, there's a 24 hour. So if you get that to uh, the uh, to the clerk, then we'll recess and print that and hold on. Yeah, so ten minute recess. Ten minute recess. Okay, so uh, the first uh, order of business then now that we're back in session is if we could get the subcommittee report minus point three, the subcommittee report minus n number three, point number three approved by the committee, then we would then uh, go to debate uh, the motion put forward by Mr. Cleese. Yes, friends. No, she said agreed. No, I so move. moved. Okay, good. So moved all in agreement? Agreed. Agreed. That's the subcommittee report minus number three approved. Okay. Now we have uh, Mr. Cleese, if you want to move your motion. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I move. Um, there's four motions that are on our order paper for today. How does this one get precedence? 
if it's not an amendment to the subcommittee report, how does it get precedence? This uh, directly affects our proceedings right now. The others do not. Okay. So that's Go ahead, Mr. Cleese. Mr. Chair, I move that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts uh, direct the clerk of the committee to dismiss legal counsel retained to provide advice to the committee given that the committee is being unnecessarily delayed through concerns raised relating to the role of counsel, and the committee is fully aware of its responsibilities and believes it is in the public interest to proceed with its scheduled business. Any comments? Jogmi? Well, I wanted to second or, or move the, uh, second the motion. Yes, and uh, just to, for all the TV cameras in the uh, room, if you could please keep the cameras off the desks and not be filming any of the materials on the desk, please. We appreciate it. Sorry, you, and so you second motion. I want to second motion. Required, no, no, not required. Just okay, motion. and I can provide some commentary there. Yes, please do. Um, so you're on, I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I think. Sorry, Jagmeet, Frank, did you want to go first on this? Uh, if, you, if you don't mind. Yes. No, not at all, not at all. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, first, uh, I want to thank Ms. Flood for the work that she has done so far for this committee. Uh, appreciated the helpful uh, memorandum. Uh, and um, I certainly uh, will be prepared to uh, recommend uh, Ms. Flood's services for uh, the select committee uh, when the government uh, finally decides to get around to respect the will of the legislature uh, with regard to that committee. The motion before us is straightforward. It respects the fact that members of this committee are fully aware of their responsibilities, not only as members of this committee in terms of how to conduct its business, but also the sensitive nature of uh, the uh, issue before us. There isn't a member of this committee who does not have extensive experience as a legislator in the various committees of this government who does not understand the importance of respecting the parameters. We discussed that at length, uh, not only leading up to this committee hearing, but also uh, it was discussed uh, in the subcommittee. We have witnesses here who have been called, who are ready to give us the information based on our questioning. I know that every member of this committee will in fact ensure that their questions respect the parameters of this committee, will respect the sensitivity, and my point with this uh, motion is very simply to let Mr. Zimmer and the government members know that we see through what has happened here this morning. There was an opportunity uh, uh, Mr. Chair, for Mr. Zimmer to raise this informally uh, with uh, committee members, had he been sincere uh, in his words as he expressed them this morning, there was ample time to have this discussion, to bring the information forward that he tabled with us at the last minute here today. There was no reason to delay the proceedings. We could have had as many hours of consultation with legal counsel as we felt necessary. But it was very obvious that the government members don't want to have the discussion about Orange. They don't want us to get on with getting the information from witnesses. And quite frankly, I believe it is in the public interest, Chair, for this committee that has been struck for the purpose of reviewing the Auditor General's report as it relates to Orange to get on with its business, to do anything less, I believe is quite frankly obstructing the work of this committee. And it's for that reason I brought that motion forward and I trust that members, members of the government side as well, who may not have been in on the play that Mr. Zimmer brought to this committee this morning, because I saw some surprised looks over there as well. This is an independent committee. It should not be a partisan forum. This is not about protecting anyone in this government. It's about getting to the truth. That's what this motion gives us an opportunity to do, and I ask members to support it. Thank you. Chuck Mead. Thank you, 
Uh, Mr. Chair, so I agree with the, I think we all agree that the spirit of this committee is to uncover the truth. Um, we're here to question the witnesses who, who are here in attendance and the wit witnesses that will come in the future. So again, no disrespect to counsel, but if retaining counsel somehow presents an obstacle <coughs> to getting to the truth, if, if having counsel being retained somehow limits our ability or delays our ability to hear from witnesses, then it's not in the spirit of this committee. We would need to continue what this committee is here to do, continue its work. So if, uh, if counsel is, and, and no disrespect to counsel, but if the presence of counsel is gonna be used to delay or to slow down this process, then it's not in the spirit of this committee. And that's why I support this bill, with, or so I support this uh, motion. Uh, with respect to um, witness protection, uh, witness protection has been uh, well covered in law. Uh, we know that there's whistleblower protection that already exists. It's been well established by the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, O'Brien and Bosch clearly indicates that witnesses who testify in committee are given immunity. Uh, that's something that's also protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, so that's already established. Uh, the law is very clear on that. We don't need any further clarification on that issue. Um, in terms of witnesses who are giving oaths, uh, that's a, something that this committee has done numerous times. All throughout eHealth, there was uh, testimony that was provided that there was no... That the, uh, I, I would respect if uh, I was not interrupted, and you'll have your time to, to indicate what you want to indicate afterwards. Um, if there is someone uh, that's providing evidence, it's provided, they've provided their evidence before, before this committee, it's happened during eHealth. Um, there was no counsel present at that point in time. Um, to request people to tell the truth is something that's uh, very uh, sensical. It's very obvious. They're testifying before a committee made up of members of parliament. Um, it would be very understandable for those who are testifying to be under an oath, to, to promise to tell the truth. We would ask no less of anyone. We assume that members uh, will be telling the truth, and that's why we don't require them to give an oath. And uh, it's... my further submission that with respect to any criminal proceedings, uh, there is no way that evidence that is adduced here would affect any criminal proceedings. They are gonna go on as they go on. Um, they will continue as they continue. And what evidence is adduced here from uh, the Minister of Health previously, from members of Orange, uh, their evidence will be kept uh, protected by the whistleblower protection and uh, that will not limit whatever OPP is investigating. They can continue their investigation. To, su to suggest that we should railroad, we should end our discussion here, we should limit our discussion here, simply because we're afraid of any limitation on any criminal proceedings, we can continue with our discussion here, uncover the truth, do what we're here to do, and uh, let the other investigation continue as it will. So my submission is, in, in conclusion, that we need to continue our work and if that means dismissing counsel to continue our work, we should do so, so that the work of this committee can continue. Uh, Mr. Zimmer. Thank you, Chair. Look, let me put the issue in very simple language. This committee ought not to fly by the seat of its pants when there's a pending, an ongoing, parallel criminal investigation, number one. Number two, <coughs> for Mr. Singh to make the statement, which um, just stunned me, that evidence under oath, at, given under oath at this committee, can't be uh, obtained and used uh, to cross-exam witnesses and so on in other proceedings is um, wrong. I expect you must have skipped the evidence class. Number two, they have another issue here, too, which is sort of hanging over, you know, and, and I'd be interested to get counsel's remarks on this. Um, the, you know, we've got two tiers of witnesses here. We've got civilian witnesses, non-MPP witnesses, who come and give evidence, and uh, they're compelled to give it under oath, and all of the, the restriction per and parameters and so forth apply to that, what they can say and what they can't say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Counsel will understand that. And then we have the MPP witnesses who are not under oath, who can come and um, are, are, are treated differently and have a different set of parameters. So all I ask, all I ask is that somebody, counsel, 
committee clerk, the chair, carefully consider those transcripts on the Gigantes and the Martel transcripts, and uh, uh, let us not proceed by the seat of our pants. I, I want to ensure, and I'm speaking against uh, Mr. Cleese's motion, we do need committee counsel. We do need committee counsel. We need the best possible committee counsel. We've got a distinguished counsel from a very, very distinguished law firm, knows her stuff, but let's make sure that we get the ground rules straight so that we pre preserve the integrity of this committee's findings, whatever they may be, and we preserve them in such a way that they don't uh, unwittingly jeopardize other proceedings which may arise out of the criminal proceedings. Thank you. Liz? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I certainly support what Mr. Zimmer has said, but I think it is important to understand that the idea of hiring counsel was actually not an idea that came from any particular party. It was the clerk's suggestion that we hire counsel. And the subcommittee met and we all agreed that that would be worthwhile because of the fact that this is unlike things that we have done in previous memory. Um, E-health was mentioned. At the time we did the E-health inquiry, there was not an ongoing criminal investigation. The witnesses were not sworn. This is the first time in my experience as an MPP that we have ever sworn the witnesses at a committee. When we did the select committee on mental health and addiction, we certainly weren't swearing witnesses. So it isn't that select committee and council is one thing and standing committee isn't. It, uh, this is different from the situation we have ever been in before. And my concern is, and I raised it yesterday, that we need to sort out the role of council. We have never within my term here, so that's over eight years, had a council at committee and have never talked about what we want the role to be. The terms of reference, I suspect, are somewhat different than we might have had in the past and we need to sort it out. Because in the possible roles of council is the issue of pre-screening questions from committee. I can't imagine Mr. Quick please wants his questions pre-screened. Uh, so in my, you're looking very surprised, Mr. Cleese, because we need to sort out what's the role of counsel, which is what I was saying yesterday when the subcommittee first had an opportunity to do this, I suggested we needed to deal with what's the role of counsel. We are spending way more time discussing whether or not we should have a discussion than actually getting on with the discussion. We could actually facilitate getting to the witnesses if we would just have a discussion about what is the role of counsel. So I will move an amendment which is to the motion that is on the floor and the amendment is and that the decision to dismiss counsel to the committee not be determined until the committee receives an in-camera briefing with respect from counsel with respect to the potential role of counsel. Ask the members a copy of the amendment. Are you comfortable with that or would you like a copy of the amendment? Are members, are you comfortable with the verbal? Quite frankly, very comfortable with having uh, a vote on that right away as part of, uh, we'll vote on the amendment and then we'll mo vote on the motion. Okay. Uh, and speaking to the amendment. Yes, and, and can you restate the amendment please as well? And that the decision to dismiss counsel to the committee not be determined until the committee receives an in-camera briefing from counsel with respect to, I have to read my own role, writing here, the potential role of counsel. So 
What continues to concern me is that we're, re oh yeah, Thanks. is the, in the subcommittee meeting, there was a list of possibilities that was presented to us. I asked yesterday that we go through those potential roles and determine in detail what it is that the potential role of council is. And it seems to me that to start the hearings, I, I understood, Stan, we already did a day with the deputy and the ADM and the, um, and, and the minister, which was like our conventional public health, our, our public <laughs> accounts hearing. But we're dealing, moving into a different realm where we've got external witnesses who are being sworn, and we really do need to determine what, where we expect council to step in, what her role is, if any, in advance. And we need to sort it out, not at some case by case on the fly where we're going to be colored by who the witness is. We need to have a neutral, non-witness influence discussion about what is the role of council. That's all I'm asking for is wh that we have the discussion. And we've wasted all morning thinking about whether or not we can discuss the discussion. Okay, finished, uh, Mr. Roulette, Jerry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And you know, uh, having been a member of this committee for uh, almost five years and chaired many committees, and some of them were uh, very controversial in the past, um, and sat through other aspects such as e-health, uh, we didn't have legal at, uh, advice at that time, nor did we have legal advice during the first presenters of this committee. Um, I do have concern regarding pre uh, precedent being set that any controversial issues found within the legislature can be delayed by enacting actions such as OPP investigations for further actions of this committee. I believe that, um, quite frankly, that uh, one of two things is, is occurring is that um, Either there is a uh, lack of belief in the ability of the council that has been presented before us, uh, in that uh, they do not have the capacity to advise us with the correct movement forward, or it should have taken place already, or that the, the full intent is to delay the committee's actions and recess this committee until such time as the OPP have completed a complete investigation. I don't believe that it is moving forward in the best interest of this committee, and I think that we should move forward with the question that has been presented before us, Mr. Chair. Mr. Zimmer. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the other reason um, uh, to uh, give the council a chance to do her work and, and brief us and find out what uh, her view of things is, is number one, so that council can fulfill her obligations to the committee and its witnesses that appear before it. And, and I say this with the greatest of respect, so the council can uh, fulfill her professional obligations uh, as a lawyer, an officer of the court and so on. And I wanna make sure that council has every opportunity to digest and uh, familiarize herself with this very, very complex matter. Uh, Franz? I'd like to call the question on the amendment and call the vote. Any further debate? Recorded vote. Recorded vote. Okay. All those in favor of the, the amendment, amendment to the amendment? Um, Mr. McNeely, Mr. Meridi, Ms. Sandals, Mr. Zimmer. All those opposed? So the only voting uh, uh, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Cleese, Ms. Madam Jalina, Mr. Singh. So being a tie vote. Being a tie vote, uh, I will vote against the uh, amendment. And now, can we call the, uh, the same question on the actual motion? The same question on the actual uh, motion. All those yes. in favor? All in favor? The motion. Do you want to record it? No record of vote requirement. All those opposed? All opposed? Okay, so it's the same thing. And once again, I will vote against the amendment. And no, against the motion. Against the motion, and the reason being that the full committee has uh, already decided the a matter of agreeing to hire legal counsel, so I'm maintaining the status quo of the uh, committee. And the committee has already decided to have, uh, to have uh, the right. hearings going on as well. So now I would suggest that we go into closed counsel. I would suggest we go into a closed session so that we can uh, decide the parameters of the uh, legal counsel. So that we can 
so that we can continue with the work of the committee. So, I, I do have a motion that appropriate time this morning to we, present this motion. We can come out of closed session at the end. We can come up out of closed session at the end uh, to look at your motion. But for now, we will go into closed session. So, so we need to, to clear. There. We will need to clear the room. If I can call the meeting to order, uh, first of all, I'd like to point out there has been a change in the uh, agenda for this afternoon for the witnesses that will be coming before the committee. Uh, George Smitherman, we had an empty slot at 1 o'clock, so George Smitherman has offered to come back and present at 1 o'clock. And also, uh, the, ch the uh, chair of the Board of Orange uh, is going to be uh, t uh, presenting at 2 o'clock. Uh, instead of uh, Mr. Barry McClellan, board member, who is going to be called at a later date. Um, so, at this point, we have uh, point three to do with legal counsel. Ms. Sanders? Yes, and just to note that we have sorted out the details of this in camera and that I am pleased to move that legal counsel provides advice as may be required by the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Is there agreement on that? All in agreement? All agreed? Carried. Okay, so our first uh, presenter this afternoon is uh, going to be from the Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation, Wendy Tilford, Deputy Minister. Are you present? Yes, yes. Yeah. Just confirm that she wanted to be affirmed. And uh, did you want to be affirmed, uh, Ms. Tilford? Sworn. Or sworn? Or sworn. Sworn? sworn? Okay. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tilford, uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give before to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Yes, and just to... I give it to her. Yeah. Okay, I'm just confirming with, that I was reminded by legal counsel that you did receive the uh, witness appearing before a standing committee on public accounts information. Right. Yes, yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll... Uh, so we have uh, half an hour in total, so that will be in there's... Uh, How much time? Eight minutes. For, oh, for five, five minutes for a presentation, and then there will be eight minutes split amongst the three uh, different parties for, for questioning. So please go ahead. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to the chair and to the committee members. I'm Wendy Tilford. I'm the Deputy Minister of Economic Development and Innovation. I was appointed to that position in December of 2011 when the Ministries of Research and Innovation and Economic Development and Trade were merged. Prior to that, I was the Deputy Minister of Economic Development and Trade. I was appointed to that position in February of 2010. The mandate of our ministry is jobs in the economy. We support the domestic and international growth of Ontario companies. We provide programs and services to foster innovation, and we promote Ontario as the best choice for foreign direct investment. I have no involvement with respect to the creation of Orange, its structure, or the delivery of its mandate. However, since the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade had some interaction with Orange with respect to a 2011 trade mission, I thought the committee would appreciate some background on this. The ministry, sometimes with partners, sometimes on its own, hosts about 60 trade missions annually. We have found it to be a very good method to introduce Ontario companies to new market opportunities. In 2010, the Ministry was considering, in partnership with the Canadian Arab Business Council, a trade mission to focus on the growing healthcare market in the Middle East. Ontario is home to many innovative healthcare companies that could benefit from expanding markets. The mission took place on, February 20, sorry, on January 26 to February 2, 2011. As with all trade missions, we promote the trip to as many Ontario companies as possible in the sector. There were 20 organizations on this mission, and Orange was one of those companies. Orange was represented by Lisa Kirby, the Director of Regulatory Affairs, and Paul Carter, the VP of Sales and Marketing. While I interacted with all the companies on the mission at group sessions and receptions, the government program was separate from the business program. I did not meet with Orange or any of the other companies individually during the development of the, mission, of the mission, nor did I accompany Orange or any company on their business meetings in the Middle East. So as the committee is well aware, I was copied on the memo from Orange dated January the 19th. 
While I do not have detailed recollection of the contents of the memo, I do recall looking at it and noting that it focused primarily on organizational structure. As the focus of my ministry at the time was the trade mission, and as the areas outlined in the memo were better considered by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care officials who were already copied on that memo, I did not take further action on the memo. A few weeks later, after the mission in mid-February, I received an email from one of Orange's trade mission participants requesting a meeting. Our ministry meets with businesses in the province every week. I would always meet with a company that had participated on a mission, hoping to learn about mission outcomes and their opinion of our services. So I and two officials from our trade division met with Orange in mid-March 2011. Orange provided an overview of the company and their services. For our ministry, the focus of the meeting was to seek feedback on our export services to assist with the ongoing delivery of our trade mandate. While I had no further involvement with Orange after that meeting, the ministry had a few interactions mainly focused on mission follow-up. So with that said, I would be pleased to answer any questions the committee has. Okay, but well, thank you very much for your presentation. And just to explain the way we're going to do this for the first presentation, we'll start with the opposition, then the third party, then the government. And the next presentation, will start with the third party. The next presentation, will start with the government. But everyone will get equal time. Who in the opposition would like to ask questions? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Please. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Telford, thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, to the uh, clerk, I have copies. Uh, you, you don't recall uh, the letter that you received, the January 19th letter? No, I said I did recall oh, you, it. you do? Yes. But you don't recall the specifics? Not the specifics. Uh, uh, clerk, could we have the letter distributed, please? Uh, the reason for that, I just want to refer you to a couple of okay. points there. Uh, can I ask you, um, first of all, with regard to the uh, mission, the trade mission, uh, who would have paid uh, for uh, Ms. Kirby and Mr. Carter to attend uh, that trade mission? So all of the participants pay a $1,500 fee to be part of the mission. That particular mission was paid to the Canadian Arab Business Council and it covered ground transportation and various reception and meeting expenses they would have when they were in market. Any other expenses occurred by the companies are paid directly by the companies. Okay, that so Orange would have covered all of those fees, the accommodations. Do you have I'm any sorry? idea what the total cost would have been after accommodation? I'm assuming the 1500 is the registration fee That's correct. to be part of it. Any idea what the uh, overall cost would be? It depends because each company makes their own arrangements. Depends, depends on which hotel they're staying in. It I does. Guess. It does. And they make those choices themselves. Okay. Um, with regard to the letter, I think you, you've been given a copy now, have you? No. Uh, could we ask, please? You were copied on this uh, letter along with uh, uh, many others, including uh, the principal secretary to the premier, uh, policy advisors to the premier, uh, the deputy minister of finance, uh, deputy minister of health, the deputy minister and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario, um, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Finance, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, the Director of uh, Emergency Health Services Branch, uh, Dr. Christopher Mazza, Dr. Tom, Mr. Tom Lapine, who was the COO of Orange at the time, and the entire Board of Directors. Uh, you held at the time the, the role of Deputy Minister Economic Development and Trade. Correct. And uh, you say you read the letter uh, no, I when said you I received it? I said I remembered receiving the package. I don't remember all the details of it. I didn't go through it thoroughly. Uh, how, can, can you just tell me uh, how thoroughly you did go through it? Uh, I read the executive summary, so I know in the executive summary enough there that was said that no public funds would be used for what Orange was proposing. I knew that it dealt with uh, changes to their corporate structure, and I knew that it said that whatever they were doing can, um, aligned with uh, the agreement they had with the Ministry of Health. However, never, I've never seen the agreement with the Ministry of Health, so it would be very difficult for me to assess whether that would be true or not. I also noted that it was delivered, it was addressed to the Ministry of Health, so I knew that they were the prime recipient on the letter. And you made the assumption that uh, 
the Minister of Health received this, and uh, I'm assuming all these other people who were copied on it, that any details uh, would be looked after by them. Is that right? Well, I also, as I said, received an, an email from Orange with an invitation to meet, and they referenced that the, the um, Ministry of Health had been talking to them about this. Did you meet with Orange? Yes, I did. I said I did meet with Orange. I met with them in March. And, and they would have reviewed this letter? Or no, what was didn't. the nature of that meeting with them? Well, they, uh, I, I didn't know. I thought it was probably in their, in their um, email they referenced the trade mission, so uh, I would have attended the meeting with the anticipation of talking about the trade mission. Uh, they did review, um, they did give a presentation that talked about uh, their services, they talked about uh, some of their service metrics, and they talked about their organization. Did they in that meeting discuss with you their intention to um, uh, put uh, airlines out of business and take over and bring in-house uh, all of the uh, uh, both fixed wing and helicopter services that they were at the time contracting out to? I don't remember them describing it that way. What would your reaction have been uh, uh, had they told you that? Uh, really not knowing how the Ministry of Health's contract is set up with them, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. But the fact that, in fact, Mr. McCurley, when he was here, uh, referred to the fact that they have standing offer agreements, uh, what he, and he listed a number of those, uh, uh, those companies, uh, what he failed to tell us, and we'll follow up with him, uh, is that some of those uh, that were on the list, uh, Orange has actually put out of business uh, because they brought in-house all, uh, all of that service. Uh, they've decided to own helicopters, they've decided to own aircraft. Uh, in the past, uh, those were contracted out to Ontario businesses who know the business, who were qualified, uh, and obviously that uh, in itself is a contribution to the economic development regionally as well as uh, throughout Ontario. I just thought uh, that uh, given your responsibilities for economic development, that in itself may have been uh, a red flag for you or at least something, uh, a point of discussion. Uh, I'd like to refer you to Appendix E, which is the last page of this letter. Uh, this uh, attachment describes uh, the corporate structure that uh, Orange uh, uh, had uh, planned. Sorry, I just want to get my glasses on okay. so that I can see. Uh, that Orange was in the process of, uh, of implementing. And for someone who um, uh, is uh, involved on uh, a day-to-day -day basis with uh, corporate structures and economic uh, activities, the very last page. Two minutes, Appendix E. Two minutes, Mr. Cleese. I have it now, thank you. Uh, did you see this when you got uh, your copy of the letter? There were a number of complicated diagrams in what they sent me. I can't tell you if I specifically If someone saw came into you today uh, and said, uh, here's, a, here's an organization that I am putting together to deliver air ambulance services uh, in the province of Ontario, what would your immediate reaction be as you look at this diagram? That it's a complicated diagram? But other than the details of it and how it related to the agreement they had with the Ministry of Health, I couldn't have commented. Would it have prompted you to ask some questions uh, about why such a complex organization was necessary? Not when I knew that the Ministry of Health were interfacing with the company on this, I wouldn't have. So you relied as a deputy minister on the Minister of Health to ensure that all of this was kosher? Uh, I relied on the minister and ministry. I deal more with the ministry than I do with the minister, um, with the ministry because they would have had the relationship with Orange. And the responsibility of oversight, I'm assuming, right? Well, knowledge of the contract and sure. the contractual agreements that would be had with that organization, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And who would like a question from the NDP, France? Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. My first question will be uh, quite brief. Is You've made reference to an email that you received from Orange asking you for a meeting to which you said you agreed to meet. Would it be possible for you to track down that email and share it with the committee? Yes, it would. Okay, thank you. I would appreciate if you could do that. Uh, the second question I have is that um, we know that uh, Minister Pupitello visited Augusta Westland, the company that sold Orange its helicopter, and then they uh, paid 
orange in 6.7 million in what looks really much like a kickback right now. Um, do you know when Minister Pocatella met with Augusta Westland, do you know if they discussed orange at all? Uh, so what I do know about discussions with the company that you referenced is uh, we, um, the ministry and the minister had met them at um, the Farm Borough Air Show in 2010. So I would have been present at that meeting. There was no discussion about Orange. Uh, in 2011, at the uh, at the Paris Air Show, there would have been a, a contact made there. I wasn't present at that, but my understanding was there was no discussion about Orange. And the minister um, met with the company when she was um, on a trade mission. Um, I was not present on that one, but I also understand that there was no discussion about Orange. The purpose of our interaction with that company was to attract them as a foreign direct investor in the province. So we were interested in them setting up some kind of a facility, training or manufacturing in the province. So that was our interest in discussion with that company. Okay. The, uh, in your capacity at Economic Trades and Development, uh, you have received you will receive a memo from a publicly funded provider saying that they receive a $5 million payout from a provider. Would that raise flags? When you deal with businesses um, where a business buys something from a provider and then the provider gives money back, any, uh, have you come upon businesses that deals like that? Are you referencing something that was in the January 19th memo? No, I'm referencing in your work that you do for, for the government, you deal with a lot of businesses. I do. So when a business transaction looks like I buy something from you, like Orange buying something from Augusta Wetland, and then Augusta giving money back to Orange, if you see those kind of transactions going on between businesses, is there a, any comments you can make? How would I know about that transaction? You would have been told. I wasn't told you about that transaction. Okay. But if you were told, would you have any comments to make? Well, I would want to understand the terms of the transaction before I could comment. Okay. When you, when you receive the 35-page memo, were you surprised that you had been copied on it? I get copied on a lot of material. I wasn't sure what the intent was of copying me on it. Did you ever clarify why you had been copied on it? No, I didn't, because many people were copied on it, and it was addressed to the Ministry of Health. So you, you received it, you read the executive summary, and you put it aside? I did. Okay. And you were comfortable putting it aside because you trusted that the Ministry of Health was going to do the follow-up? I didn't have uh, any knowledge of, uh, to be able to participate in that discussion. So, yes. Okay. Um, good, uh, is it still morning? Is it afternoon? Good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> um, I just had a couple of questions just with respect to your dealings with uh, or your any conversation that you might have been involved with with Orange, I mean with uh, Augusta Westland. Um, when during that discussion and you were hoping to or the minister was hoping to have Augusta Westland invest in Ontario or, or provide some sort of uh, training or facilities to manufacture mm -hmm. their product, their helicopters here. Um, As we do with many companies. Yes, of many, of course. We are core business. Certainly. Um, was at what stage of those discussions? At what stage did they get to? They're they're quite early in the, they're quite early in their discussions. Uh, was there any? We haven't, we haven't landed that investment. So. <laughs> was there any um, indication of uh, on, on behalf of Augusta Westland that they were interested in investing in Ontario? Um, I think they were interested in many jurisdictions. So nothing specific. Okay. Certainly listened to the merits of Ontario. Our job is to sell the province and the merits of the province. Certainly. Um, and was there any discussion about providing uh, helicopters t to Ontario in general, just providing the, the product itself? No. Okay. Um, and 
Was there anything that uh, Augusta Westland indicated that they'd like to see uh, in, in Ontario for them to for it to make it uh, desirable for, for them to invest in Ontario? No. Okay. I have nothing further. No further question. Okay, thank you very much. And to the government, Mr. Zimmer. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I don't have any questions. My uh, colleague does, but I just wanted to take uh, a minute. If, like, 60 seconds or so. Uh, this morning there was an exchange uh, essentially between Mr. Singh, the member for Brampton, Gore Malton, and uh, the exchange was about the how um, taking an oath uh, for citizen witnesses might uh, differ from how MPP witnesses are, are taken. Citizen oaths obligations flow from putting up their hand on the holy book of their choice or affirming and it's a very dramatic exercise to tell the truth and so on. MPP's uh, responsibility to tell the truth flows from the legislative uh, act and rules governing their how they conduct themselves as MPP. Both parties have an obligation um, to tell the truth. The point that I was trying to make that it was it was more dramatic uh, for a civilian witness to hand up on a holy book and affirm it. And uh, in the course of that exchange, um, Mr. Singh made the point that the obligations were the same. He was correct on that. I put a different emphasis on it, but I particularly regret my um, uh, um, unfortunate remark that he'd missed his evidence school class. And uh, I apologize to Mr. Singh, the Brampton for Gore Mull, Brampton Gore Malton for that. Thank you. Other further questions? No, I have no further questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Deputy. You made um, reference to the fact that uh, Orange was included <coughs> in an Ontario trade mission to the Middle East. I wonder if you could give us a brief idea how firms are chosen to go on a, on a trade mission. So we advertise trade missions, usually electronically, to as many companies in the sector as we can. And um, companies uh, respond by completing an application if they're interested. That's pretty much how it's done. Um, there may be the odd firm that comes to us that um, submits an application. And when we talk to them, we realize that uh, in, in conversation with them that they're not quite prepared uh, to take this on yet and maybe some seminars or something else would be a better vehicle first for them. Um, but other than that, it's first come, first serve. Okay. It's the way we decide on who goes. Okay, so that's really cut and dried, first come, Very, first serve. Yeah, and it, in this case, um, because we did it in conjunction with the Canadian Arab Business Council, um, all the interaction like that, uh, the submitting of the applications was done to them. It wasn't even done to the ministry. Oh, okay, so the application was actually made through the Canadian Arab Business Council that's as correct. opposed to the ministry. That's correct, and so was the payment. So I'm thinking then that it's probably, well, let me just ask you the question. Were you instructed at any point by the minister or any of the minister's political staff to include Orange on the, um, on the mission? No, never. Okay. Yeah, clearly that would not be the case because somebody else was no. making the decision, not you anyway. That's correct. And I know my colleague's curious about where you went on the... So I'll turn it well, over to my colleague well, here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Deputy, for taking the time and uh, attending this, uh, this, this meeting. Uh, yes, my question actually is, uh, as uh, Ms. Sandel mentioned, which countries in the Middle East did you, uh, or did, did this um, mission uh, visit? So we went to Dubai, then we went to Abu Dhabi, uh, we went to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait, and to Qatar. Thank you. It was a busy mission. Yeah. Any, thank any you. further questions? Thank you. No, for Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, for coming and presenting to the committee. You're today. welcome. Appreciate it. So now we can just, if you want to just make a general statement while we're waiting for George. Okay. Um, yes, we were just, uh, Mr. Smitherman apparently is on his way, so I expect him here uh, in the next few minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's five to one by my watch, not by the clock on the wall, which is off by a lot. Um, we do have several motions before the committee. Uh, a number of them are to do with adding more witnesses, which is uh, something that, that currently we have lots of witnesses bef before the committee, and that's something that's not, I would call, urgent. We also have a, uh, a motion to sit, uh, or I believe a motion that Mr. Yes, Barrett wanted to put with regards to hearings next week. 
So if you want to put that Just motion. Before I, I would like to uh, put forward a motion that the uh, Standing Committee on Public Accounts, the committee, hold meetings to call witnesses during the week of April 9th through April 12, 2012, and sit for up to two full days so that the committee may continue its debate and inquiry into the 2012 Special Report of the Auditor General of Ontario on Orange Air Ambulance and uh, related services. And I, I would ask for a recorded vote as well, please. Any comment, uh, Liz? And it, it, uh, if I could just ask that if we, when Mr. Smitherman shows up, since he sat here all morning, if, if we have to, uh, if, we, if we don't yeah. get to this. That we yeah, and I'm not going to speak for a long time. I'm simply going to note that the, uh, in the subcommittee report that we passed this morning, we in fact effectively already added an extra day for the additional witnesses and that, um, We've already, uh, we, we have lost two this morning. We're making up one this afternoon in the free time period. But in fact, this morning, we already added a day. So I think that uh, it's quite possible that it's unnecessary to sit during the Easter week. Uh, we all, uh, this is really late to bring the, the uh, motion. I know certainly on the, those days during the Easter week, I'm fully booked. Okay, any other comment, Mr. Please? And I, I will mention as well that uh, I will be getting a sub for next week. I, I don't know about the NDP, but that's kind of the reality of our, our work. Mr. Please? Uh, well, Frank. Uh, as uh, my colleague indicated, uh, for those who can't be here, uh, certainly parties can uh, sub in uh, members. Uh, we've already lost a half a day uh, thanks to the uh, uh, tactics of uh, thanks to the tactics of uh, the government members, uh, and uh, I think, in fact, I have a number of additional people who have come forward who have indicated they would uh, want to testify. So uh, I would think that we want would want to take advantage of every opportunity uh, to hear uh, from uh, witnesses on this. So uh, certainly, uh, I'm in support of this, and I would hope. Uh, that we'd, we would have the support uh, of uh, the government members on this. Any other comment? Yes, that is. Well, just to note that we did lose an hour and a half this morning. One of the witnesses is being made up this afternoon and in a half hour that we had available. And the item that we spent an hour and a half with you arguing we shouldn't take time to discuss it, we actually dealt with in half an hour at lunch. Okay. My only yes. comment is we, we, we do have a roster. And the witness is here. Okay, the witness. Uh, <laughs> we do have a roster. <laughs> the roster only by we that. Have a vote on it. We can have a vote now yeah. if, if you're all done speaking. Well, we no, do. I, I, just, I, I would just like to remind uh, Ms. Sandals that her colleague, uh, Mr. Zimmer, uh, agreed uh, that uh, we need to get on with this and uh, he himself agreed that he would be willing to have hearings uh, during uh, the break week. Uh, so I would hope that he would be consistent in his vote on this motion with what he said to, uh, to the media. And the only thing I wanted to clarify, we do, all three parties uh, have additional witnesses. I see the motions before me and uh, for that reason, uh, I, I request additional days of hearings. Okay. okay. Are you ready to vote on the motion? Okay. Recorded vote. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Um, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Cleese. Yep, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Cleese, Madam Jalina, Ms. Forrester. All those opposed? Mr. McNeely, Mr. Meridi, Ms. Sandals, Mr. Zimmer. You're you're abstaining, Mr. Zimmer, is that correct? Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So, then, so all, all those opposed then? Yes, say again. Okay. All, all those opposed? opposed? Ms. Mr. McNeely, Mr. Meridi, Ms. Sandals. So then okay. motion carries. Motion carries. So we'll, we'll notify the House leaders by uh, a letter requesting extra time during constituent week. Okay, so we, uh, we shall notify the House leaders by letter requesting extra, extra time during constituent week. 
And okay, so now uh, we have, I believe, Mr. Smitherman is here. Uh, Mr. Smitherman, if you could come before, and I'd first of all like to apologize for making you wait the whole morning. Uh, not at all. Not that you haven't spent a lot of time around this place, but uh, uh, I'd appreciate you. Uh, for the clerk. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, He's going to pour <coughs> himself some water, if that's okay, Chair. Yes, please do. Thank you for being flexible and agreeing to come back and uh, sorry to waste your time this morning. Did you, and, and just to Firm. clarify that, that you did receive the witness appearing before a standing committee on public accounts? I did. Information? After the close of business last night, I looked at it briefly this morning. Okay. I was going to bring my counsel, but he's in daycare. Okay, and uh, clerk will affirm you, Mr. Smither. So could you just uh, raise your hand? Uh, Mr. Smitherman, do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. So if you want to take uh, five minutes for a statement, and then there will be eight minutes for each of the parties to or caucuses to Mr. Chair, I, I timed this carefully, but I confess I may be five or ten seconds beyond, but not much. So Great. thank you for your uh, consideration. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the Public Accounts Committee, it's my privilege to be here today. I cherish the principle of accountability, and I support the idea that having more information in the public domain makes for better government. So I will gladly share the knowledge that I have the context that I have is the 2003 to 2008 period. My motivation and actions during this period were to address well-documented risks to health and human safety. So even here in the midst of the firestorm where it's clear orange had lost its way, we should be careful not to forget that Ontario possesses one of the world's most advanced medical air operations with well-trained and dedicated frontline staff. It's a very expensive and essential element of our healthcare system that tries to help equalize access to care across a wildly large and difficult terrain. Because we have this medical air transport capacity well integrated into our trauma system, it saves many lives. But the real trauma is the abuse of public trust perpetuated upon the people of Ontario. I take responsibility for not having detected this risk and therefore entrusting Dr. Mazza to build an integrated medical air transport system. Aided and abetted by a strongly credentialed board, stories have emerged of a hazy shell game seemingly designed to leverage a public asset for personal gain. If true, this was an abuse of the public trust, and I regret not having had the prescience to eliminate such risks. The better news is that we have a good system that is well resourced and with the steps taken by Minister Matthews, a sense of purpose has been restored. I can't tell you who missed their opportunity to act at first evidence that Orange had gone rogue. The performance agreement had multiple mechanisms where the contract could be cancelled. This coupled with the ministry role as paymaster represents ample power to bring a rogue entity to heel. The report commissioned in 2008 by the Ministries of Health and Finance and prepared by Mayors Norris Penny LLP, a report which should be made public, provided a series of recommendations to the Ministry. From what I am told, the Ministry's response to this 100 plus page report may have been lacking. When I left the Ministry, I was not aware of any accusations and from the moment I left there, about 1400 days ago. I have paid Orange little mind. Had I known that there were swirls of scandal, I most certainly would not have taken the risk of bringing an external visitor to Orange as I did last fall. When I became minister in 2003, we did not have an integrated system, despite repeated calls from coroner's inquests and the media alike. Additionally, a 2003 accreditation review conducted by the independent US-based Commission of Accreditation of Medical Transport Systems recommended a system overhaul. A particular concern they cited was the absence of a clear line of authority amongst the dispatch center, the base hospital, and air ambulance operators responsible for service. We fixed that. Other coroner's reports spoke to the risks being posed by the ministry's inability 
to validate the safety and maintenance of the fleet of private aircraft then contracted to do medical air transport. Today, Ontario has the most modern and efficient fleet just about anywhere. At crucial critical care transition points, we implemented orange staff bland ambulances to enhance the continuity of care for critically ill patients, thus improving their survival prospects while saving money for several municipal land ambulance services. Sometimes that transfer across ferries, through traffic, or over long distances can take a long time. And when a situation is critical, minutes really, really matter. This is especially true in the North. I want to provide just one example where a service enhancement was implemented in order to save lives, to buy some of those crucial minutes. Put yourself in the position of a, being the family of someone who just sustained a life-threatening injury in a snowmobile accident in Horn Payne and transferred via Orange to Sudbury Airport, now set to endure the lengthy transfer from Sudbury Airport to Sudbury Regional Hospital. Would you feel better knowing that a highly specialized Orange critical care team was on hand to get your loved one into the specialized hands of the hospital? I know that politics is always in the air here and perhaps more so in a time of minority parliament. But I do ask that you consider just how your report will influence confidence in Orange for the stricken hiker, the First Nations dialysis patient, or the car crash victim who lays wondering if his next breath will be his last. Thank you, and I look forward to aiding the committee's work in any way that I might. Perfectly timed, and uh, we'll go to the NDP first this time. Uh, Friends? Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Smitherman, and it's a pleasure to ask you a question. It feels like I've done this before. The I, I'm a bit out of practice, I'd have to <laughs> say. But. Um, it's, it's rather interesting that right now we have Minister Matthews as Minister of Health. And on a number of occasions, it feels like she's throwing you under the bus. It feels like she's blaming you for a huge part of the scandal we're dealing with right now from your failure to have an RFP when this was first contracted out, from your failure to put together an accountability agreement that gives the Ministry of Health the leverage that they need. My question, my first question will be, if you had stayed as Minister of Health, do you figure this scandal would have happened? Well, there, there's three or four questions rolled up there, and I, I, I look forward to having a chance to answer, uh, to answer each of them. Uh, uh, personally, um, uh, I said in my comments that I really think it would be important to ha get into the public domain this report that has been prepared uh, by, the, uh, by an outside consultant, because it was a crucial overview to the period of time that I was the minister. When I left the Ministry of Health in 2008 and moved to another ministry, Dr. Mazza was making $298,000, was reporting that and complying with the Sunshine List and the like. And the activities that went on subsequently were activities that were not to my knowledge. Um, and I cannot imagine a circumstance where I would have tolerated a situation where Dr. Mazza ended up making $1.4 million and where the organization lost its focus. But the ministry bears a lot of responsibility for this because it is in the, in, in the ministry which had eight or 9,000 employees where on a day-to-day -day basis there are people that are paid to wake up and to focus on it. And the real question I have is at what point did they decide that they were dealing with what I describe as a rogue entity and what steps did they take at that time to bring it to heel? It's my suspicion, but I'm only speculating because it's beyond 2008 that this was even in advance of the time of Minister Matthew's arrival at the Ministry of Health. Hmm. Interesting. If we go back to 2007, uh, we'll be testing your memory there, but you were still Minister of Health at the time, uh, you authorized a one-time $2.9 million funding bump to Orange. And uh, would you have done this if you hadn't known how much Mr. Mazza was being paid if you didn't have information about salaries, would you ever agree to increasing a budget? Well, at the time, we knew how much Dr. Mazza was being being paid. I don't. It was somewhat less than two hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars, and it was in full compliance with the Sunshine List. That that question actually is, in a sense, further evidence that at that time, to the best of any knowledge that I have, 
there were no uh, red flags being signaled. In the same time frame and context, the provincial auditor twice reviewed Orange. Public Accounts, Accounts Committee had their own hearing, I think in 2006, and then just subsequent to that, this external report was, uh, this re external report was ordered. To the very best of my knowledge, in that time frame, Orange was operating, operating well. Through the report that the provincial auditor has provided, we learned that the ministry did not have a grasp on the finances there, and I think that that came as a surprise to all of us. That, that, that uh, uh, adjustment in uh, their budget in, the, in that fiscal year, I don't have access to the ministry files to know what the motivation and justification for that was, but there were three things happening that may have been associated with it. The implementation of new critical care ambulances, like the, ones, uh, the one that I mentioned, which can be in service in a place like Sudbury. Orange was responsible at that time for EMAT, the medical, uh, the, mobile, uh, the uh, mobile hospital, and the implementation of a new angioplasty program at Thunder Bay Regional Hospital was forcing us to deploy an additional aircraft in Thunder Bay as backup in case any cardiac patient required transfer to Duluth. Any one of those items might have been cause for that adjustment in the budget, but without more information from the ministry, I can't speak more. I, I'm, I, I could only answer uh, in that way. Okay, coming back to 2007, 2008, uh, the accountant at Orange, his name is Keith Walmsley. He came to the ministry and he said that Chris Mazza and others were in the process of creating this web of private companies and in 2008 started to hide their salary the uh, sunshine list that came out in 2009 did not have Chris Mazza on it. Um, it. Basically, this whistleblower, Keith Wormsley, went to your ministry while you were minister. Were you, did you ever talk to this man? Did no, anybody and, you, ever? Uh, where, where did I learn about this? I learned about this in a Toronto Star story. I believe the gentleman himself says in retrospect, he realizes he should have got that letter to me. But this is part of the reality of the Ministry of Health. 350,000 pieces of correspondence every year addressed to the minister, some number like that. Um, former Minister uh, Whitmer would be aware of those volumes. This was intercepted at the ministry level. And really, it begs the question, as this was an early warning, and the gentleman seems to have been quite articulate in the representations that he made, uh, where the ministry, uh, in a sense, intercepted this, I think it started at the Ministry of Health promotion, if I'm right, made its way over to the Ministry of Health. And until I read that story in the Toronto Star, I had not been aware of that, uh, of that uh, gentleman's uh, point of view. Yeah, but, but in the ministry, they clearly were. You have two minutes. In, in your statement, you did say that you went back to Orange last fall. Have you, except for that visit, have you had any other dealings with Orange since for 1,400 days since you were not Minister of Health? Yes, on one other occasion, I attended a meeting at Orange where they were, which was focused on the philanthropic side as they were looking for ideas about how they could gain some financial support from the broader community associated with the equipment outfit for the, uh, for the, for the helicopters. And I don't know, um, I, I don't recall the time frame of that, but that was the only other involvement that I had. And I did that on the basis of uh, just as a private citizen, uh, uh, you know, giving them an hour of my time and offering some suggestions. Okay. It, you said that if you had found out that uh, Chris Mazza was making $1.4 million, you would have <laughs> acted and thought that this was not acceptable. Um, the, in 2008, his salary was never uh, put onto the sunshine list. Shouldn't there have been a uh, reaction from the ministry sooner? It, actually, it's in 2009 that we find out about you're gone by that time. But when you see that Mr. Mazza is no longer on the sunshine list, wouldn't you have asked one of your staff to check that out? Th that's right. So for time frame, the sunshine list is produced in the final days of fiscal 2007-2008. Within two or three months, I leave the ministry. The sunshine list for the subsequent year would be prepared later in the year. Mm -hmm. But I do think that that is a particularly egregious action that should have sent a warning signal across somebody's desk. And I really think for me, increasingly, I ask myself, at what point did the people in the ministry who on a day-to-day -day basis wake up with the responsibility to focus on matters related to ambulance, what was their reaction to that? 
I did not know about that until I read all of these stories in the paper only recently. And like I mentioned before, I certainly wouldn't have ventured to Orange last fall with an external visitor in tow to get myself embroiled if I knew that there were all these swirls of, uh, swirls of scandal. Thank you, and if we can move to the government uh, now. Uh, yes, this. thank you, and uh, uh, sorry that you've been here twice today, but we're glad that we've got you up here now. The company is nice. Yeah, we're, we're all charming, aren't we? Um, when you were appointed as Minister of Health in 2003, you make some reference to problems in the air ambulance system. Could you describe those a little bit more? Well, like, what were you told when sure. you got the briefing? It, it really, it wasn't. It, it, it was that coroner's reports and other independent bodies and the media, over quite a lengthy period of time, had come to the conclusion that or, or, that uh, air ambulance, as we knew it, was too fragmented. And to their credit, I would say, the previous government, I believe it was my direct predecessor, Tony Clement, had brought the eight ambulances together in a base hospital program. Prior to that, we had the circumstances of the ministry running dispatch and doing some work on the, private co on the relationship with private aircraft contractors. And we had eight different helicopters, all in the budgets of eight different hospitals around Ontario. Minister Clement took the step to consolidate all of those aircraft under one base hospital program at Sunnybrook Hospital with Dr. Mazza as the medical director. And that, I think, was a good step in the right direction. But you can imagine all of the stories that have been written over time about the circumstance where dispatch and operations are not in the same organization. Our intentions in moving forward were to create an integrated system and despite all of the failings that we know about, which were mostly about, seemingly about trying to leverage this now integrated system, I believe that the system that we have in Ontario is a very good one, is a better protection of human health and safety than it was when 2003 when I became minister, and it's my fervent hope that this can be restored as a sense of pride and confidence for the people of Ontario. So how did, and, and it's interesting because I was on public accounts, I think, when the auditor's previous report came in and he was looking not at Orange but at the pre-existing system. And I think the or auditor's findings in that previous report, the auditor is nodding at me, um, that he described many of the same problems that you're describing now. Um, so then how did we get from the identification of the problems to the creation of, of what eventually became sure. Orange? It well, was initially the Ontario <coughs> Air Ambulance System. I hope someone will come back to this question of, of sole sourcing versus RFP because those that insist on the idea that there should have, an R, should have been an RFP are proponents for the privatization of that service. We were actually, if you look at it, bringing the service in-house to a not-for-profit uh, entity which had features and attributes quite similar to hospitals. Independent capacity to choose their board of, uh, board of governors, substantial elements, almost all of it, funding from the, uh, funding from, uh, uh, from the uh, ministry, and with the capacity to raise some uh, resources on a philanthropic basis to augment the public resources that were available. So the initiative was to create an integrated service on that basis. It was not in the pattern of the Ministry of Health to house entities like that inside. Uh, and this is, uh, this is, I think, an important insight in terms of how the model emerged. So it's almost as if what you were doing was setting up something that was more on a hospital model as opposed to a private contract. I mean, it's somewhere well, it more... it was our... We saw it as... We saw, we, we saw these as our assets. We saw these as public assets. It wasn't about taking a public asset and throwing it out there to a CEO and their board to try and reap some reward out of it. No, not at all. It was... if you And if you look at this agreement, which lots of people have talk, spoken about, but I'm not sure as many people have actually read it, this is, in a certain sense, a playbook for the uh, bringing together of assets uh, and uh, roles and responsibilities that until that time were fragmented and across the landscape. And um, so when, when I think about the legislation that's now been tabled, 
uh, where the minister is suggesting that some of the powers that she has with respect to hospital boards and, re and importing some of the language that's in the Hospital Act into the Air Ambulance Act, that's actually reasonably consistent with the original approach that you were well, taking she, to she, she, Obviously, she's in a situation where she's operating retrospectively, and she's in a situation where uh, this, perhaps where the same lawyers that advised me and drafted this are now advising uh, her and drafting that. I don't know that, but you know, the ministers, they come and go, the deputies, they come and go, and the ministry staff stay there forever and ever and ever for a long time. And that institutional memory that they have is an important protection for the public, but only if they actually choose to use it, uh, to choose to use it well. I have no doubt that there's an opportunity to look retrospectively and say, well, we could have had that or we could have had that. But I don't, uh, from a review of this, and from knowing that the ministry was practically the whole paymaster for that organization, I don't draw the conclusion that the ministry's hands were tied in bringing this, what I refer to as rogue entity, to heel. Thank you. You have uh, two minutes left. Oh, I've got two minutes left. Um, well, I guess what, one, one of the elephants in the room then is as the a uh, new service was being um, developed, um, what sort of a role did Dr. Mazza play in, in the conversation then as it was being developed, the new vision? Well, uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, un and this is, where I've, this is where I've said candidly, is that the responsibility that I bear is that this individual, and again, like, some people have tried to suggest that I invented him, uh, of course, he was running the base. He was in Ontario, the most knowledge individual with respect to the operation of medical air transport that we had. So was when you referred to uh, Minister Clement setting up an air base, it was him that actually had the air hospital. Dr. Dr. Mazza had been running the one helicopter as the medical director from Sunnybrook Hospital since 1996. So it was natural, it was, it was natural that he was there in the, in the pecking order and that he should be relied upon in helping to, uh, in helping to, bring, a, uh, to bring a model forward. Again, I go back to the question is that if you look at it from the time that I left, to the very best of my knowledge, uh, the, the amalgamation of services, the, cre the elimination of fragmentation and the creation of an integrated organization had been the focus. And I take responsibility for not having seen the risk that people might have ulterior motive. But then I ask the question is, the people that wake up every single day in the Ministry of Health, when did they first get an inkling that something was going awry and what steps did they take then? And that's an area where I don't have as much information as I would like to have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cleese. Thank you. Mr. Smitherman, thank you. And uh, first let me thank you uh, for the statement that you made uh, that uh, you regret not having had the prescience to see what was coming. Uh, you're actually the first person uh, to take responsibility. And uh, I, I just want to thank you for that. I want to ask about the uh, performance agreement. Uh, I've read the performance agreement. There are a number of schedules in that performance agreement, and I, I do think that apart from some of the things that may have been missing there, uh, what that performance agreement did do uh, was give you, the minister, and the ministry, the authority to intervene the authority to oversee, and in fact, it was very explicit, that original performance agreement was very explicit that the ministry has a responsibility to develop certain uh, delivery requirements and standards together with Orange. I want to ask you this, knowing what you know about that agreement because you signed it, when you determined that something may not be right, what steps would you have taken as minister to ensure that the requirements and the standards of that performance agreement were being met? Well, the first part that's important here is, like I said, the context that I can speak to, to most knowledgeably is 2003 to 2008. And in that time frame, I was not a, made aware by the ministry or outside interests 
that something had gone awry there or that the thing was off the rail or gone rogue, to use the language that I used. But I do personally, and you know, you, 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 you've enjoyed the privilege of serving as a minister, uh, as have I, is that it seems to me that the combination of powers some power is that which is given by way of legislation or by a signed agreement. Much of the power that a minister can exercise is the power of persuasion, of the use of a bully pulpit, of embarrassment as required. And the third bit, and this is what I refer to in a Toronto Star article or a Toronto Star interview as kind of this sugar daddy role. If I'm in a circumstance as a government minister where my ministry is funding the lion's share of an entity, I feel, notwithstanding whatever deficiencies retrospectively a lawyer might have found, I've got a good bit of uh, capacity to bring a wayward organization to heel. And I ask myself the question, what went on? And that's why this report, which has not been public, I think it's an important one. And it may, it may in fact say things that are not helpful to me in the grand scheme of things, but it was a report that look, took a hard look at the early days of Operation of Orange and I wonder where that went when it got to the ministry. In the final analysis, had you been the minister, you would have found a way to intervene and to bring this rogue organization to heel. Only in the circumstance, the only way that, I, of, of course, you know. Thank th you. Thank you. Of, of, thank you. Uh, th that's I'd the, like to move on to another Okay, but with, res point. with respect, that, right, with Mr. respect, Mr. that wasn't my complete, Excuse me, that Mr. wasn't my complete answer. Please, but I would say this, I would say, I would say this respectfully to the member, is ye yes, of course, any one of us wants to say that we would have done that. But I was there with four and a half years of institutional memory. Four and a half years. So of course, on the day after four and a half years, I had all that institutional memory to apply. But then another minister came, and yet another one before the current, and, and then the current minister. And my only question is this, is you can only act if you have the information. Who had Thank the you. information, and Thank what you. did they do with it, is a question which I don't think, at least I personally, don't know enough about. Thank I know you. people in the ministry had information, when did they actually send the signal that the entity had gone awry? Thank you. I'd like to move forward to uh, early November 2007. At that point in time, the Ministry of Finance made a very specific effort to bring the financials of Orange under the Ministry of Finance into its consolidated statement. When the Ministry of Finance took that initiative, I understand that Orange, through one Alfred Apps, with Don Guy's assistance, put forward the case that those financials should not be included for very specific reasons. I also understand that that message was sent to Mr. Jameson in the Premier's office via Jennifer Tracy. Now, I happen to believe that this represented a turning point because had the financials of Orange been included under the Ministry of Finance, the appropriate oversight would have been there even if the Ministry of Health failed. The Ministry of Finance would have in fact ensured that there was the appropriate oversight and certainly questions would have been asked. The former deputy, and I, I, I want to just put this on the record, that in February, 20, in February of 2006, uh, the former deputy minister, uh, Sapsford, was asked, in fact, he was asked the, the question by uh, the, the member from Kitchener Center, Mr. Malloy at the time, what is the relationship between Orange and the government. Deputy Sapsford at that time explained it very concisely. In his words, in his words, the relationship between the new corporation and the ministry is what I would call a transfer payment relationship. And it's because the Ministry of Finance saw that as well. They wanted to incorporate those financials into the Ministry of Finance. Can you tell me what pressure was brought to bear through Mr. Guy and through Mr. Apps to ensure that that consolidation did not take place? The matter that, firstly, I 
any of them. I, I, I've never heard that. Uh, I've never heard that before. So I, I can't. Uh, I can't shed any light on that. But I would say that for all of that, to my mind, it does not separate the Ministry of Health and the staff of the Ministry of Health from their oversight responsibilities. Like I, I take your point that that might have been an added layer, and maybe that is an early signal, but it's not a circumstance that I have any uh, information about. I assure, I assure you we don't want to let anyone off the hook. Uh, the primary responsibility clearly was the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health. My point simply is that based on the information we have is that there was political interference that actually allowed Mr. Mazza and those at Orange who wanted to uh, leverage, as you put it in your own words, public funds for their personal means. It was that political interference that actually brought down uh, the, the, the barriers that would have prevented that. And I was just hoping that you might be able to shed some light on that. You say you knew nothing about it. Uh, perhaps Mr. Jameson can help us when we talk to him a little bit later. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for coming and uh, being so patient That's this it. morning. Yeah. Yep. Time flies when you're having fun. Thanks for the. Thank you so much for the. Uh, yes. Thank you for the chance. Thanks for coming before us. Yes, Mr. Smitherman, if he would be willing, if there is some other information that we would like to follow up with him on, would he be willing to come back uh, and spend some more time with us? Well, as I understand it, if this committee sends out a message that it wants to hear from me again. It's not a matter of whether I'm willing or not, okay. but of course, uh, but of course, uh, uh, spending the day uh, here with all of you today <coughs> has uh, refreshed my interest in Queens Park. So, <laughs> if it uh, if it aids the if it aids the committee in their effort, then uh, most certainly. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Order while we're waiting for the next uh, witness to come in. I don't know whether we're waiting. We're we're ready. Uh, okay. We're well, ready this will just be, because I think the next anyway, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Cleese made reference to a. Um, um, a meeting and a, and a document between one uh, Apps and Stevenson, and uh, then he said, um, uh, Stevenson, then he said, uh, implied that he's going to raise those matters with uh, Mr. S uh, Stevenson, Stevie? Yes. Um, James, I'm sorry, um, which I expect is about to happen now. So I think we should have that document in front of us. No reference to a document. I have my personal notes. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Okay. Zimmer let's has let's no move on to, to our that. next presenter. Then we have from the office of the Premier, Jamison Steve, Principal Secretary to the Premier, who is here for the next uh, half hour or so. You have you have uh, five minutes to make a presentation, and then there will be eight minutes amongst the three parties questioning you. And, and you did did you receive the witness appearing before Standing Committee on Public Accounts? Information? I did. I received it last night. Thank thank you very much. Not and, at all. Uh, our clerk will. Sorry, I just want to raise your hand, uh, Mr. Stevie. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give to this committee, touching the subject of the present inquiry, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jamison Stevie. I am the principal secretary to Premier Dalton McGinty. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee. It is my understanding that this committee has been struck to consider the special report of the Auditor General on Orange. <laughs> I thought it would be helpful to this committee by providing a brief history of my employment and a quick outline of my roles and responsibilities in government in my opening statement. I graduated university with an honors Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Education and a Bachelor of Laws. I began my professional life as a lawyer in the litigation department at Faskin Martineau. I practiced law there from 2001 until December 2003. In January 2004, I joined the office of Minister Jim Bradley, then Minister of Tourism and Recreation, as his legislative assistant. I held that position until September 2004. In that role, I was primarily responsible for preparing, per, for preparing Minister Bradley for question period. From September 2004 until October 2007, I was the health policy advisor in the Premier's office. During that time, I also held the health promotion and seniors policy portfolios. In my role as policy advisor, I focused on broad policy development and policy decisions in the area of health. In particular, I focused on key health results like the reduction of surgical wait times and improving primary care. My work over those three years also included involvement in the development of legislation, like the Lynn Bill and drug reform. Following the election in 2007 and the swearing in of the new cabinet, I was hired as Chief of Staff to Minister George Smitherman, uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I held that position from November of 2007 until June of 2008. 
During that time, I was responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the Minister's Office, focusing our efforts on reducing emergency room wait times, lending shape to the government's negotiations with doctors, and working with the Minister and the Ministry to finalize a budget for the Ministry of Health. During my time as Chief of Staff, I had a staff of approximately 30 people. Since June 2008, I have served as the Principal Secretary to the Premier. In that role, I am primarily responsible for the development of public policy government-wide. I work with Cabinet, Caucus and the Public Service to develop and implement the government's policy and legislative agenda. In addition, I have an active oversight role on particular strategic documents like the budget, the fall economic statement and any thrown speeches. I have a staff that fluctuates between six to eight people who have carriage of several policy files. Based on the questions I have seen in the House, it is my understanding that I am appearing before this committee primarily because I was one of the recipients of the letter addressed to Minister Deb Matthews from the Chair of the Board at Orange on January 19, 2011. I am happy to speak to that issue or any other questions that you may have. From someone fiercely interested in and responsible for the development of good public policy, I think there are many important lessons we can learn from the situation at Orange. This committee is looking into what happened at Orange because the Auditor General's investigation revealed some significant areas of concern. Although there were a number of accountability mechanisms in place with respect to Orange, it is clear that they did not work. As Minister Matthews has stated, we as a government could have and should have done a better job. I believe that the Minister has taken strong steps to remediate the situation at Orange and move the organization forward so that it serves the needs of Ontario patients. The larger public policy question I know that we in Ontario will all have to wrestle with is how to develop appropriate accountability mechanisms as we look for ways to provide top quality government services efficiently. I'm pleased to answer any questions this uh, committee may have. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much. And the uh, government uh, will have the opportunity to ask questions first. Uh, Ms. Sandals. Um, I wonder if we could go back then and think a little bit about your time as uh, from 2004 to 2007 as health policy advisor. Um, can you describe a little bit more about your role then and I guess whether or not you would have intersected with Orange in any significant way during that point? Certainly. Um, my role at that time uh, for any health policy advisor in the Premier's office would be to uh, help develop the policies that are coming through committees and into Cabinet and shepherding those issues as they go through our processes of uh, being considered by Cabinet and Caucus. Um, I would say a lot, a lot of my interactions uh, on policy files would also have been around key health results. Um, we would have our health results team involving briefing the Premier and preparing him for uh, how we were achieving things with respect to uh, surgical wait times, uh, primary care reform, namely 150 new family health teams, uh, the acceleration of medical school spaces and whatnot. Uh, my interaction with Orange, uh, the file, uh, would have primarily been through the development of the legislation. Um, I didn't have direct involvement uh, in the creation of the accountability agreement or the performance agreement that's been the subject of uh, much of the conversation both here and in the House, um, as that's something that would go to Treasury Board and deals more appropriately with accountabilities and financials. I would deal more with those items at that time uh, that dealt with public policy uh, that went through policy committees and then into Cabinet. Um, during my time from 04 to 07, um, I believe I, I met with Orange, I believe once, basically as the organization was being set up and getting a sense of uh, of uh, what services they were going to be providing. So it would have been at the policy level as to how, as you say, what services would Orange uh, be delivering, what would be the change in delivery from current services. It was at that broad policy level. At a broad the policy level within the health sphere, um, as opposed to my current role, which would have more of the broad policy across government. But no, uh, there is uh, very little operational aspect uh, related to the health policy role. So, and if we can go on then to your current role as Principal Secretary to the Premier, um, are you, as Principal Secretary to the Premier, and I think you've just answered this question, but let's be specific, do you get involved in operational issues at the ministries in your role as Principal Secretary? Typically not. Um, what I would say is uh, my involvement is more on the basis of making sure that we're driving forward the, the government's agenda and working with caucus, cabinet uh, and the premier. Um, there, are, there are operational elements that are going to come forward in any particular policy submissions, um, the delivery of a tuition grant, those types of things, but on the day-to-day -day, uh, aspects of how something is delivered by way of a public good from, from a ministry, no, I would not. Uh, get involved in those matters. So the issue, the example you give of, a tu of the tuition grant, it would not be that you're, uh, that you're 
uh, con spending a lot of time on the operational issues related to an existing file or initiative, it's that you're looking about, at what operational issues might be involved in a new program like the tuition grant and ensuring that the operational issues around that have been dealt with as part of the policy submissions to Cabinet. In that instance, I would say that's correct. I think um, on the day-to-day, -day, that's far more responsibility of, of the Minister's Office and the Ministry. Uh, which would have been my experience when I was Chief of Staff at Health. Okay, thank you. And uh, one of the issues uh, that has certainly arisen is when uh, the auditor prepared his draft report and sent a copy to, I think it's the Assistant Dep Deputy Minister or the Director? Assistant Deputy Minister. Okay, so... Uh, uh, of Health? Of, of health. health, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when that draft report went to the assistant deputy minister, relevant assistant deputy minister at health, would you have been forwarded that report? No, I, I typically don't get involved in the draft reports from the Auditor General. Um, my work as it relates to public policy development usually comes upon the release of the report where there are typically numerous recommendations on how public policy or um, aspects of government can be improved. But there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be an issue of you having seen that draft or for that many, for that matter, the drafts of the other two reports that went to ADMs in health about the same time, a bit no. earlier maybe, but same same thing. You were yeah, saying we, I'm we looking would have at had the had another 15 value for money drafts that went to another 15 ministries. We do about 15 a year, so that's just part of the normal process. And you wouldn't have seen any of those. No. Um, I, the draft reports are typically, as I say, dealt with at a, at a different level. Um, this is the first time I've had a chance to, to meet the Auditor General, so no, it's uh, my involvement on draft reports is, is no. No. Okay. That, because that's use, very useful for, for us to know. And you did make uh, reference to the letter, and I'm sure people are interested in your response to the infamous letter of January 19th on which you are copied. I am. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what would have happened when that letter arrived in your correspondence pile? Yeah, that's fine. Certainly. Um, when I, I get a series of correspondence on any daily basis, whether it be email or, or letter, um, I was one of uh, many parties copied on the letter, uh, has, been, has been noted in this committee. Um, I was not the direct recipient of the letter. It was addressed to Minister Matthews. Um, also, uh, Mr. Alfred Apps had called me in December to ask for a government-wide, if I could set up a government-wide briefing um, for uh, him to come and talk to various ministries. I didn't think it was appropriate for me to do that. I recommended that he contact the Minister of Health, uh, the Ministry of Health, to set that up. I think that's probably what gave rise to the letter being addressed to the Ministry of Health. Um, when I received the letter, I knew that a briefing was taking place. Um, I reviewed the first couple pages, understood that the briefing and the letter were for more for informational purposes, um, and knew that uh, if items were to arise that were uh, necessary to be flagged for me, that they would be done so by those people who were being briefed. So first of all, my approach to the letter was similar to that which I am CC'd on a series of letters, um, number one, and then number two, since I knew a briefing was taking place, uh, and I was dealing with... Uh, in a context in, in a January of any given year, um, in January of 2011, uh, cabinet briefings, cabinet agendas, drafting the legislative agenda for the final session of our second mandate, a budget, and I think at the time uh, negotiating an MOU with the City of Toronto um, for a new transit deal. And we won't get into that one. That's another story. Thank I, you. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, Frank? Thank you. Mr. Stevie, thank you, and uh, I'd like to go back to the performance agreement. You said you weren't uh, integrally involved in developing that performance agreement, but you also said that you would have become familiar with it uh, when it made its way to uh, management board uh, of cabinet uh, for the submission. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I believe what I had stated is typically when something goes forward to management board or treasury board, the policy advisors are, are more responsible for those items that are going through policy committee and or cabinet. Right. Um, so I was aware that something was going forward to treasury board, but that would not have been my direct responsibility so as you a never policy saw advisor. The, uh, performance I have no recollection of seeing the policy okay. agreement, no. Uh, I would like to uh, follow up uh, with you uh, on the issue I raised with uh, Mr. Uh, Smitherman and uh, get your perspective on this. Uh, the, um, and, and again, I, I really believe that 
uh, all of this could have been avoided, the scandal side of this, uh, if in fact the financials would have had proper oversight. And uh, you've heard uh, the description that uh, Deputy Sapsford gave when asked uh, at this committee back in 2006 how he views the relationship between Orange and the government Ministry of Finance. His response was that given that uh, some $115 million are being transferred from the government to Orange, that in his view, this is a transfer uh, agency. Uh, do you agree with that characterization? Um, I, I believe what has been put forward both at this committee and in these hearings, and again probably by former Deputy Sapsford at the time, um, was there was a contractual relationship with Orange, and there was a flow of money for the provision of particular services. So I think that's probably a fair characterization. Okay. Based on that, it was the Ministry of Finance uh, who saw that arrangement, uh, looked at what was happening uh, early on in the game in terms of how the financials were being organized at Orange, and they made the approach, as I understand it, to bring those financials uh, under the auspices of the Ministry of Finance into its consolidated statements, as it does with every other transfer agency. The information that I have is that Orange strongly objected to that. And because they weren't getting anywhere, uh, they retained the services of uh, uh, Alfred Apps and Don Guy, uh, who, according to uh, information that was given to me uh, by someone uh, who was there at the time, uh, through their efforts, they contacted you and that that message that they don't want uh, to be overseen by the Ministry of Finance, that that message was sent to you through Jennifer Tracy, who you know. And I, I assume that you were working with her uh, in the Premier's office before she went to Orange, right? She had worked um, in our communications department in okay. the Premier's office, yes. What do you recall about that uh, message that was sent to you? Um, upon hearing you mention it in this committee, is I have no recollection of any interaction. Um, Jennifer Tracy would call me on, on occasion, far more uh, on communications aspects as they related to Orange. I have no recollection of their concern of being consolidated onto the government uh, books. Um, and even at that, I, I have no recollection of moving on any information that would keep them off of the government books. Do you agree that uh, that was the right thing for the Ministry of Finance to do, to at least make the effort to, to bring those financials under the Ministry of Finance? That would be a question for the Ministry of Finance and what they were trying to do from a financial perspective. That would have been beyond my scope and something I would have relied deeply on the Ministry of Finance's advice. And you never discussed Orange with Don Guy? No. Uh, did you ever discuss Orange with Mr. Apps? Um, I did. Uh, as I said, uh, my most recent conversation with uh, Mr. Apps around Orange would have been in December of 2010 when he contacted me and asked uh, me and my role as Principal Secretary to set up um, a cross-government briefing for uh, what was contained in the letter uh, of January 2011. At that time, I advised him that it was not appropriate for me to do so and it wasn't something that typically fell within my job description to set up cross-government briefings. I encouraged him to speak with the Ministry of Health as that is who the direct relationship was with and uh, he went about doing so. Was uh, was Mr. Apps registered as a lobbyist uh, at the time? Um, I'm not aware if he was or was not. I know that uh, upon review of the letter in preparation for for this committee hearing, um, there is statements. Uh, there are statements in the letter that they are in no way uh, lobbying. As you observe the debate uh, in the House uh, on this issue, uh, as someone who was present at the Ministry uh, of Health. Uh, as someone who's been integrally uh, involved uh, in policy development, uh, I'd be interested to, to know from you uh, whether you believe uh, that uh, the Ministry of Health, as we heard from the auditor, uh, did in fact fail in its oversight responsibilities. I think we as a government, um, from top to bottom, could have done a better job, and I think that's what the Auditor General pointed out in his report. Um, I think that the performance agreement that was set up um, 
I think you, in the previous comments, felt that it was substantial enough. Um, I think what we've learned is that there were actions and behaviors that took place beyond the scope of the performance agreement that uh, the government, both ministry and, and ministers alike, uh, once we became aware of situations, uh, moved on them swiftly. Um, obviously, our oversight needs to be improved, and that's what we're trying to do with the new performance agreement and the new piece of legislation. I'm certain you re reviewed this file extensively. Can you tell me uh, how many former staff, uh, either in the Premier's office or Minister's offices, uh, went to work at Orange, uh, some of whom are still there? Can you tell I, me that? I definitely reviewed my interactions on the file, sir, in preparation for the committee, but I, I can't answer your question. I'm, I have no idea how many former staff, um, minister's offices or premier's office work at Orange. Can you think of one? Uh, you named one. Uh, Jennifer Tracy is a former premier's office staff okay. uh, who I believe still works at Orange. Uh, you can think of no one else? No. Uh, there was a former staffer. Left. Thank you. Uh, there was a former staffer, uh, Scott Lovell. Um, who, and what was uh, his role in the ministry before? Um, he worked in the minister's office, uh, not the ministry. He was uh, stakeholder relations uh, under Minister Smitherman, and I'm not sure what his position at Orange would have been. Uh, no one else? Um, not to my knowledge. Interesting. Thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you, and thank you uh, for coming before the committee. Today, I'm sorry, and I think, uh, we have the NDP yeah. now to go. Go ahead. Uh, uh, good, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, so just wanted to ask some questions about your oversight. Um, you help with the initial setup of Orange, is that correct? No, I, I would be involved in the policy development that led to the initial legislation okay. around Orange, but I, I think it would be an extension of my role to say that I helped in the initial uh, formation of Orange. Sure, so you, you, you were involved in the policy development but not the actual implementation of the, of the Orange um, organization? That's correct. Okay. Um, in the policy setup, what was your involvement with the policy setup? Um, my involvement would have been uh, dealing with the policy as it came through committee and to cabinet um, and uh, providing information to the Premier as it came through. Specifically with respect to Orange, what was your input in terms of Orange policy development? Um, the role of a policy advisor in the Premier's office versus that of uh, uh, in a Minister's office is more of an oversight role. Um, the direct creation of materials would come more from the Ministry and the Minister's office level. So mine would be more of a commentary and or input at a higher level rather than the creation of it uh, at the ground level. So what was your input then on a high level with regards to Orange? Um, I, I, I don't have any recollection of, of any uh, dramatic input uh, into the document. Um, it seemed that we were uh, consolidating a number of services into one not-for-profit entity uh, for the purposes of improving both efficiency and patient safety. Okay, and did you have any input then in terms of how that uh, the care was to be delivered or the way it was to be organized? No. Okay. Um, when you were, uh, when this was set up, you were chief of staff to uh, Mr. Smitherman, is that correct? No, that's not correct. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I, I was chief of staff um, from November of 2007 yes. until June of 2008. I see. And I believe the time frame that you're talking about is in the 2005-2006 era. That's right. Um, in terms of oversight, um, do you ha are there any policy considerations in terms of how one should oversee an organization such as Orange? I, I think many of those policy considerations are, are addressed in, uh, in the Auditor General's report. I think you're looking at issues of uh, service provision, um, the expenditure of the public dollar, um, as well as uh, um, in healthcare in particular, the outcomes that are, that are achieved by way of the service. Were any of these, uh, these considerations, uh, to your knowledge, were they ever executed in terms of was there any request made um, to follow up with Orange in terms of their um, patient care or their salary disclosures or any sort of uh, demands or any demands made that you're aware of? Um, on, based on the roles that I've held in government since uh, I've worked here, those would not be issues and items that would come across my desk, so I, I, I can't speak to the question. Um, at any point in time, did uh, information regarding a salary disclosure or the lack of salary disclosure with respect to Orange come across your desk, just that issue in general? Um, no, uh, when I was uh, Chief of Staff, I believe uh, was, I, I stopped in 2008, as I said, and I believe that was based on the information that's come forward to this committee the last year that uh, Dr. Maz was on the Sunshine List. And after that, in my role of Principal Secretary, 
um, the inclusion or exclusion of folks on the on the sunshine list isn't necessarily something that would come across my desk. Uh, when did this issue uh, reach the Premier's office in general, the, the orange scandal? Um, I would say probably post-election in 2011 when we had the issues and, and the stories uh, both in the Toronto Star and the questions being raised in the House, um, more and more alive to the issue. Obviously, we'd had the Auditor General's uh, review taking place, I believe, as, I believe, as of late of uh, 2010, um, as items started to become uh, more clear as possible malfeasance happening at Orange. I think that uh, that's when it became aware to the Premier's office in general. Before this kind of broke in the news, um, just to give you one op more opportunity, was there any uh, information or any inkling uh, of anything going on at Orange that crossed the Premier's, uh, that crossed your desk uh, that would have been in the Premier's office before what you've indicated the post-election uh, period after October 6th? Um, in my time on both the health file and then as Chief of Staff, uh, there, was, there was nothing that had come to my attention about uh, the service levels or um, anything happening at Orange that would give rise to concern. Um, in my time as Principal Secretary going forward until uh, post-election, um, I believe there were some questions in the House raised uh, by Mr. Cleese in, in April uh, of 2011. Um, but so did that come across my desk? Not necessarily, but I think obviously when something's raised in the House, uh, it it's becomes uh, an issue definitely for the Minister, if not folks who deal with legislative affairs in the Premier's office. Okay, I just have a final question then my colleague will take on. Um, in 2010, this issue was raised by Howard Hampton in committee in a public uh, standing, or standing public accounts committee. Um, were you aware of the question being raised about salary disclosure, uh, and was there anything that your office did? Um, n that was not made, I was not made aware of the questions being raised in estimates. Um, that's typically something that would be dealt with more um, by legislative affairs and issues management. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you said that Mr. Epp called you in December of 2010. Correct. Uh, any idea why he would call you? Certainly. Um, I would say for two reasons. Uh, number one, my role is one that um, often gets those types of requests um, for meetings with the Premier, um, uh, for briefings, who should they contact within government, number one. And number two, as I stated in my opening statement, I had practiced law at Faskin Martineau. Um, so while I didn't practice with Mr. Apps, I would have been uh, a known entity to him as someone who was a junior associate there for almost two years. Did he leave you with any impression whatsoever that he was using those previous knowledge and influence to try to uh, gain what he wanted from you? Uh, two aspects. Uh, number one, I, I, I think I take exception to the notion of previous uh, influence. Um, he. He would know me uh, from my interactions at the law firm, but no, it was, uh, he thought that it was a good place to start, was my sense, um, in an effort to try to brief across government um, on a series of, of issues, and I advised him that talking to the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health was the best way to go. When he talked to you, did he make any uh, statement regarding his involvement with the Liberal Party? No. He didn't introduce himself as to what position he had within the Liberal Party? No. Do you know? Um, at the time, I believe he was president of the Federal Liberal Party. You knew this when he called you? Yes. Okay. The, um, you were in uh, your present position when M Minister David Kaplan was asked to resign. When you were uh, there uh, with the Premier, did you ever ask the Premier to let Mr. Kaplan go? No, I wouldn't have that type of authority or influence. That at the end of the day, that's a decision of, of the Premier. So Mr. Kaplan uh, found himself embroiled in a scandal not much different than what we're going through right now, and uh, the Premier asked him to resign, and you knew nothing about this? No, I, I, I knew that the process was underway, but the question previously was if I had advised the Premier to ask for Minister Kaplan's resignation, and that was not advice that I gave. A minute left. Okay, and um, have you spoken to the Premier about Orange? I have spoken to the Premier about Orange, yes. Uh, primarily um, in my role as Principal Secretary in the development of policy going forward, particularly uh, in response to the Auditor General's report. Um, and the drafting of the, uh, the next performance agreement. 
um, and the drafting of the legislation would be the primary way that I would speak with uh, the Premier about Orange. When was the first time you talked to the Premier about Orange? Two ways. Uh, number one would have been in my interactions back in 2005 and 2006 in the drafting of the legislation and um, the creation of the policies that were going through caucus, sorry, through uh, committee and through the cabinet. Um, and uh, speaking <coughs> to the issues that are central to the discussion here at this committee, um, the first time I would have spoken with the Premier probably would have been um, in December or January uh, of 2011-2012. After thank, Mr. Thank Apps called, did we're, you make any calls or emails? Thank you. Uh, we're, we're out of time. That's right. That's right. Okay, go ahead with that. Uh, after you talked to Mr. Apps, did you send an email? Did you make a phone call? Did you do any follow-up regarding his request? I contacted Mary Lowe, who is the Chief of Staff at the Ministry of Health, and advised her that I thought she would be the best person to arrange uh, the briefings that Mr. Apps was looking for. Okay. I, I called her. You called? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for coming in today. Thank you. James? The next, uh, just while we're getting organized for the next question, just a, a point of order, which is really in the nature of asking some advice from uh, council, uh, because I expect this will come up uh, from time to time. But um, in uh, Mr. Cleese's uh, round of um, questions, he posed a question with, with this uh, premise. Um, <clears throat> I happen to know from someone who told me such and such, and then based on that, um, put put a, a, a question to the witness, which s sort of said, "Look, I know this from so and so. Uh, he didn't disclose that name or how he got that information, and used that as the basis of a question to the witness. Is that um, uh, so? That's in the nature of, you know, using a a hearsay um, statement, if you will, to ask a question or contradict the, a witness. Is that something that, uh, in your judgment, um, the name of that person, or in, if it's a document, for instance, someone says, I have a, I've seen a document that, and then puts a question to, to it, that this committee should have the identity of that person or the um, copy and identity of that document to help Council. the work of the committee. Kathy? Yeah, and, uh, does the committee want me to provide my, my response at, at the moment in public, or do you want me to send you a privileged memo on that issue? Um, w w well, I'm more concerned uh, to get the answer so that um, if, if it, uh, and I expect it may well come up in the future so that we can deal with it then. So, uh, I mean, Mr. Cleese has already asked his uh, question, set it up like that. So what's the best way to deal with this? You know, to ensure that uh, we're being fair to everybody and all the members of this committee have the background documents that any of us in either side of the House um, are basing our approaches on. Um, so, so two points. First of all, um, the rules of, of hearsay don't apply within this committee in the way that they would um, in, a, in a court of law. Um, and, and so questions that rely on hearsay or on information that was obtained from someone else um, could be put to a witness here um, in terms of whether the name of the individual needs to be provided or the name of the document needs to be provided. Um, you know, I, I think if the, if the witness requires more information um, we have told the witnesses that they're free to ask for clarification of a question, so they are aware of that. If other members of the committee feel that a document is needed by them, um, they can okay. certainly ask the chair for a, a direction that a document And would it be open, just on your first, I understand, I accept your second point, one question on your first point, would it be open to a committee member if a question, as Mr. Cleese raised earlier, I mean, you're telling us that the witness could say, well, uh, who told you that? So I know how to res I can respond to it intelligently, carefully. Could a committee member say, um, Mr. Cleese, uh, you know, who told you that? So we can do our homework. Well, I'm asking the the council, and that's why we've engaged the on the first point. You, I, I, I think you said the witness could ask for the identity of the. Well, what I've said is, if a, if a witness requires clarification to be able to respond to a question, they're entitled to ask mm -hmm. for that clarification. The chair will then, can rule if there's an issue about okay. that. 
similarly, a member can ask for a document and the, and the chair will rule. And these issues are more issues of procedure of the legislative committee um, than strictly legal issues, given that the rules of hearsay don't apply okay, here. So if we can call our next witness, please, uh, Mr. Ian Delaney, uh, the board chair of Orange. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Delaney. And did you already receive the witnesses appearing before standing committee on public accounts information? A horrifying document, yes, <laughs> I did. Good, well, thank you for coming today, appreciate it. And uh, he's going to be yeah. clerk will swear. So, Mr. Delaney, if you could just raise your hand. Uh, do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And it, uh, you have five minutes to make an opening statement, and there's eight minutes for each party to ask questions of you. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, not much of an opening statement. I am the uh, I am the chair of the new board of Orange, which has been in place for two months. Um, this, as uh, members uh, of this committee may know, is a volunteer position. Um, I'm very I was very honored to be asked to, to do this. Uh, similarly, uh, the board uh, that has been uh, selected. Um, I can uh, I can certainly assure the members of this committee is a very high quality board. Uh, these are uh, dedicated people who, in the last two months, have undertaken an enormous uh, amount of work to uh, begin to move the Orange organization forward in a fashion that uh, would make Ontarians proud. Um, all I have to say for the moment. Okay, thank you. And the PC party gets to begin <coughs> questioning today. Uh, Mr. Please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Delaney, for your time. I'm tempted to start off by asking what the share values are, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I, I, I won't do that. Uh, first of all, thank you for your volunteer efforts. Uh, it's a huge job uh, that you have. And uh, I'd like to start by asking uh, who you got the call from uh, to begin with uh, to invite you into this, uh, uh, into this role. Well, I'm not entirely sure how my name came up, but the call came from uh, one of the Premier's assistants whose name I cannot remember. I've never met the person face to face. Okay, you know the, the Premier personally, do you? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, do you know anyone in the government uh, personally? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. And uh, uh, could, could I, uh, you, you must have some sense, you, you must have asked, uh, why are you calling me? Uh, what was the response? Uh, I, I didn't ask that question. Uh, I'm, I, was, I was quite pleased to get the call. I uh, stepped down in uh, early January from uh, the, my primary occupation as the chief executive and chairman of uh, the Shared International Corporation, which is a place I spent most of my time. Um, I'm still the chairman of that organization, but I've given up most of my day-to-day -day duties, and it, I'm assuming it came to someone's attention that I might be looking for gainful employment. I'd like to ask about uh, your role uh, as chair. Um, what, is, uh, what is your mandate? Uh, what is it that you've been asked to do? I've been asked to, to chair the company and in and, and conventional uh, fashion and, and, uh, and terms, uh, the, the board of directors is responsible for the oversight uh, of the operations of Orange. Uh, the uh, formulation uh, together with the Ministry of Strategy and to ensure the strategy gets implemented uh, in light of uh, the uh, operations. What was the formal process of your appointment and the appointment of the other members of the board? Um, the, um, the formal process was, uh, well, the, the previous board, well, let, me, let me say at the outset that uh, I have very little knowledge of what went on prior to the appointment of the current board. Um, it, uh, I made it very clear to uh, the, the minister at the time, I had no interest in presiding at an inquest. I was more than happy to take on the challenge of moving the corporation forward. Uh, and so my knowledge of what went on before, other than with respect to the, the tidying up of several of the, the corporations in this complex structure, um, my knowledge is uh, um, pretty much what's in the Auditor General's report and in the press. So uh, narrowly, uh, the, uh, the previous board was asked to resign. Um, and and uh, my understanding of the legal position of that would be that they were asked to resign. There, nobody could compel them to, to resign by the very nature of the, 
of the corporate uh, structure. Uh, so they volunteered to resign, you would, you would say. And at the same time, uh, uh, the six uh, members of the board, new members of the board, um, agreed, agreed to voluntarily uh, be appointed. So more specifically, my question is who appointed you? The minister. The, the, so the, the minister, minister asked us to serve, yes. Okay, but there's a formal process. Do you have some documentation? Was it an ordering council appointment? I'm, I'm trying to get a sense here of what the line of responsibility is. Well, the line, as you, as you may know, the, uh, the, the, uh, corporate, the structure on which, under which the corporation acted for most of the recent period of history was a federally chartered non-profit organization. And as such, it had, it had two, uh, um, if you will, administrative classes. As a charity, which is, which is, is what it was, uh, there are members of the charity, and it's the members of the charity who actually appoint the, the board. And so uh, the, in the prior organization, the prior structure, the, uh, the members actually were also the board. Uh, so they not only resigned as board members, they resigned as members of a charity. And technically, uh, we became the members of the charity um, by the sponsor, which was the minister, uh, and, we, and then from that we became the board. Now that so structure, sorry. I, I just for clarification, you're saying by the minister as the sponsor? Yes, the stakeholder, if you will. I, I, I don't understand. The previous structure I understand, or I think I do, uh, the members appointed themselves. Yes, as directors. As directors. And they volunteered to resign. Yes. That structure is still there, the yes. corporate structure. It's slightly changed now, but. Uh, okay. Now they're resigned, and you're saying that the minister appointed you. As members. As I, members. I, I don't mean to be too vague on the point. I'm sure there's a lawyer in the room who's more Feel competent. Feel free to just say you don't more, know. Uh, I, I, more I'm competent just, at You know, this what thing. I'm concerned about is that we're coming out of a mess. Yes. Uh, an, an entangled mess. And hopefully we're bringing some clarity to the new structure. Okay, well, let me talk about the new structure okay. if, if I can. Then. The, the old structure was um, cumbersome and lent itself to uh, behavior that was less than transparent. In that case, may could I, I? I would like to answer the question, ma'am. Go ahead, please. I, I think it's general, useful for general knowledge. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, 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 the better and more appropriate structure would be to shift the federally chartered not-for-profit organization to a provincially chartered not-for-profit uh, corporation. That's a two or three step process of which we are uh, two steps into at the moment. Uh, um, so that the, the, the ultimate position would be to have the orange, the top orange company as an Ontario and OBCA corporation. That, that gives the, the provincial government uh, more ability to intervene directly, which it, it couldn't do in a, in a federally chartered corporation uh, to the same extent. Um, and so we're about, we're two steps, there's, we have to go through a two-step process at the, at the federal incorporation, and uh, the third step will take place sometime in the next 30 or 60 days, which will result in the Orange Corporation, the top corporation of which I am the chairman, being an OBCA corporation uh, with, a, with a much clearer line of um, authority t by the minister to the corporation. I just have one very quick question, very if I might. Uh, public companies and other private companies, uh, there are certain uh, liabilities that a director takes on uh, when they accept an appointment. Yes. Could you just comment very briefly uh, what obligations you, uh, as a chair of the board, and your, direct, your new directors have taken on? What, what liabilities uh, do they take on in, uh, in their new roles? Well, there are 
very real liabilities. We we are we we are the first line of of defense, uh, and uh, we are charged with executing those responsibilities. Failure to do that does expose us to liability. Um, we um, it's like any corporation anywhere. The uh, the directors are responsible for outcomes. In the most in most of the cases, there's no personal liability other than for certain specified acts, uh, willful bankruptcy and things like that. Do you thank, intend thank to you, pursue? Uh, thank you, I'm sorry, you're overdue of time if we move on to the NDP. Sorry, I'm enjoying the line of question. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully Friends. I'll be just as enjoyable. The, uh, <coughs> you come from, share it, a very well diversified global company. Orange is the f a fraction of the size of share it where you come from and certainly is far less diversified than where you used to work given that uh, would you describe orange previous corporate structure as understandable um <laughs> i am i am no stranger to complex corporate structures we know that um so I, I, I certainly understood it. Um, it, um, it was a structure which lent itself to a lack of transparency, um, both by virtue of being a, a federally chartered uh, uh, not-for-profit corporation, and then by virtue of having arm's length corporations from, uh, apart from that. So it's, it's, it's not certainly not the most complex corporate structure I've ever seen, but it, it, it did differ in a couple of ways. Um, one is that on many of these uh, uh, subsidiary corporations or related corporations, the board of director of the top companies also served as directors of these subsidiaries or, or uh, related corporations. Uh, in any of the structures that I would ever work with or set up, uh, we wouldn't allow that because that causes the board itself to have differentiated interests. And so while some of those corporations endure today and must endure for some period of time simply because they hold licenses or other things which can't be transferred instantly, we've cleaned up most of the, uh, the redundant, completely redundant or corporations. Um, but the better, the better business practice would be that the, that the board of directors of the top company only serves as directors of the top company and all the other corporations are, uh, the boards are, are uh, populated by staff and you really treat them not as corporations, you really treat them as divisions so that you have an undifferentiated interest in the top board. Aside from, as you said, to uh, take away from transparency and giving the ability to move money around, could you think of a useful purpose for the corporate structure that was developed at Orange? Uh, usually when these corporations are set up, they are done to either isolate liability, <clears throat> excuse me, minimize tax. They're typically set up for some kind of advantage. Um, I, I think the, uh, I don't know, I, I, I wasn't there, but it, uh, it <clears throat> splitting them into the, the nomenclature that's evolved as the for-profit and the not-for-profit, um, splitting them into the for-profit and not-for-profit clearly was, was a, a, a business intent to, to conduct a business uh, away from the um, principal um, federally chartered corporation. So you see nothing else, would you recommend some kind of a modified structure like this for Orange right now? No, Is there not right any now. purpose no, that no, this I could can, serve? No. Uh, our, our task uh, for the next uh, couple of years uh, is, is, is a very straightforward uh, application of uh, basic business principles to uh, rebuild the leadership of Orange and uh, reestablish the credibility uh, of the corporation. Uh, we have our first and foremost uh, uh, preoccupation is uh, safety. Uh, secondly, and it's a, is, is efficiency. Um, and so we, we have spent a great deal of time on the oversight in those two areas, but the, the, the more 
fundamental building process that needs to go on in the next two years is is a new a new uh, class of leadership and uh, reaffirming the the brand. So this idea that the knowledge skills that has been developed in air ambulance in Ontario could be exported to other areas so that uh, Ontarians would benefit from this. This is no longer on. Uh, in the short term, I don't believe it is because in the short term, I don't think we have the credibility. And have you ever contributed to a political party? Yes, I have. And which one was it? Years ago, not not recently, <laughs> to the Liberal Party. Thank you. Uh, just touching on that corporate structure, um, this this is for, for all intents and purposes a quasi-public institution. The fact that it's primarily funded through the, through the public. Um, if you were to see uh, this corporate structure in something that's a quasi-public institution, first of all, do you agree with me that, that that's a fair assessment, that's a quasi-public institution? No, I think it's a public institution. Okay, fair enough. Nothing fair. quasi about it. Nothing quasi about it. It's even, even better. Then, given that it's a public institution, uh, did that corporate structure, if you looked at that, would that raise some concerns that there's something going on here that doesn't make sense? Uh, uh, at arm's length, I don't think it would. As I say, I'm no stranger to uh, complex corporate structure. Um, and, you know, and, and goodness, I don't even know in, in various of my companies. I, I suspect the number of corporate entities, they vary by jurisdiction, they vary for tax effect, they vary because you want to isolate liability, you want to isolate a problem. Sometimes you have differentiated ownership in, in subsidiary corporations, partnerships and the like. So there's nothing you know, nothing a priority in looking at that organizational, that corporate layout that would have said to me, uh, this is uh, this is inappropriate. Uh, clearly, when you when you delve into it, I think there's, some, as you, your committee has learned, and, and only from what I know in the papers in the Auditor General's report, uh, there was all was not as it seemed. Um, one last question, then I'm going to leave it over to my colleague. Um, did do you think that, uh, I mean, uh, the way that this, the being a public institution, um, should have been set up the way it was set up, in your opinion? Well, it's an interesting, well, the, 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 two the, minutes. the, the concept of a, of, a, of, a, of a charitable organization to do this is not a new model. Uh, I suspect, I don't know for a fact, but I suspect that it, and that people were looking uh, out to Western Canada, to the province of Alberta, for instance, to the the STARS model, uh, their, their shock trauma air rescue society, uh, which is also a charitable organization, very successful. It's been going for 25 years, uh, and it's an organization with which to whom we are trying to get some exchanges of information um, set up, and and, the, and, a, and, a, and a not a, and I suspect it was the model. The STARS organization is 70 percent, order of magnitude 70, 72, 73 percent, funded by donations. Okay. And I, and I think that was the original model for, for Orange. Thank you very much. Are Thank you, you. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Um, we know that Dr. Mazza owes a lot of money to Orange. Um, how much effort and what kind of effort are you putting into getting in touch with Mr. Mazza so that he pays his debt to Orange? I am putting zero effort into it. It's in the hands of lawyers. It's in the hands of lawyers? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And uh, the, the government, uh, Ms. Sandals? Yes, thank you. Um, just following up on that last line of questioning, or not about Dr. Mazza, but about corporate structure, because you're obviously much more comfortable with corporate structures than most of us on the committee. When I looked at the organization chart, I found it bewildering but I think what I hear you saying is that somebody as somebody who's familiar with looking at complex corporate organizations you didn't find it unusually bewildering that the structure in and of itself was not a red flag no it, it in and of itself it wasn't and the as I, as I did mention however the one thing that that instantly would have been a red flag was the fact that you had different directors serving on different organizations and that sets up a differentiated interests at the part of the top board which is not a structure that I would tolerate. 
Okay, but but just looking at the looking old at the chart didn't structure itself, necessarily no, it's, it's send not, one off in no, 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 in, in a rage. Okay, because no. I I think for those of us who aren't used to our charts, we look at that org chart and say, oh my goodness, but that's more a reflection on us than it is on the organization. <laughs> you can say yes, it's okay. I <laughs> okay. won't be insulted. <laughs> Um, since you since you were appointed as the chair, um, obviously there's been a number of things that have happened. But two of the significant things is there is there has been a new performance agreement signed. There has been new legislation tabled, uh, and I'm sure you're quite familiar with the new legislation. How do those two things change the relationship between the ministry and Orange? Well, it gives the uh, it gives the ministry much the minister and the ministry um, much more authority to intervene in the in the event that they they are uncomfortable with outcomes. It troubles me not at all. I think the the new performance agreement uh, is is perhaps uh, overly restrictive in some in, in some regard, but it's a, a natural consequence of going from. A, uh, one that didn't work to, to over, slightly overcorrection the other way, but it troubles me not at all because, at bottom, uh, it, it deals with uh, uh, transparency and uh, integrity, and um, I can assure you, having worked with our with our board and from my own standards and the standards that we've agreed to adopt as a board and in the natural inclination of the other board members, that uh, and in, that our our own particular standards would transcend anything the ministry might want. And how important is that legislation in terms of shifting those accountability uh, structures that were in place in the past and will, if the legislation is passed, be in place in the future? Uh, not at all, really. Uh, it, it, it does provide uh, for more, the ability, it provides the ability for more direct intervention, uh, quicker intervention. It does, it does. Uh, uh, give the ministry m more rights to information audit uh, and the like, um, but uh, and that uh, is not in any way at odds with the um, with the operation, the basic operation of the business, and and, uh, and I don't anticipate it's going to be in any way uh, a drag on the on, on on our board, simply because our board has higher standards than that performance agreement. So, so from the point of view of the operation of Orange as currently structured or as currently evolving, it gives you the flexibility to be an excellent ambulance service. It gives the ministry the opportunity to have the accountability that if needed, and I'm not accusing you of in any way uh, attracting the need, but where anything to, uh, in the future to go off the rails, it gives the ministry additional um, opportunities to step in. It does, and, but uh, and I've, none of that is troubling to me in, in, by way of operation. There's a, a modest uh, increase in expense in terms of reporting and monitoring, um, but um, in the main, it uh, it doesn't have. Uh, in, in, it's certainly not a drag on on what our board considers to be our our challenge and our opportunity, frankly. You made reference to having uh, relatively little interaction with the, the previous um, problems at Orange. But I'm wondering if in uh, your role as board chair since you've been there, whether you've seen any indicators that the previous management at Orange had deliberately misled, deliberately provided misleading information to the minister or the ministry? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, I'm being intentionally obtuse uh, on these points. Um, it's just uh, others. I, I, think of the, I think that at the present time, if there is a drag on management, as I think we've got five sets of auditors in there looking at different things. Um, it's, it's, it makes, a, makes the current operation uh, a little tedious. Um, but I have no interaction with those auditors, and, and other than reading the Auditor General's report, I have, I have no, no particular knowledge. I, I must say, I must say that, and, and so and to, to the extent that you, you stop the problems, the problems have been stopped. The, the corporate structure has been clarified, uh, redundant corporations put into bankruptcy, um, management which uh, uh, were found to be wanting have been uh, sent away. Uh, and so our uh, our immediate uh, our immediate priorities are a new leadership 
in getting a new leadership. Always, always, always subordinate to the safety factor. Um, and, but I must say we've got good material to work with. Uh, the, um, our board has, is, is completely engaged. Uh, many of our board members have traveled as far afield as Sudbury and, and Thunder Bay uh, to get right down on the ground and look at, look at issues and talk to people. I myself have talked to pilots and paramedics from Toronto, Timmins and, and Thunder Bay and over the course and before the passage of many more months, I think our entire board will have been to all our bases for a, uh, an on the ground uh, session with, uh, with frontline people. The frontline people are marvelous. They yeah, are dedicated. You have a minute I, and a half. I would tell you the frontline people, we have absolutely no concerns at all about the dedication, professionalism of our frontline people, our pilots, our mechanics, our, our, um, our critical care, our advanced care uh, people, they are, they are all committed and they are all terrific. Uh, we have the benefit of, of uh, one of the most modern <laughs> fleet of aircraft in the world. Uh, um, and, and all of, the, all of the, uh, the questions and issues associated with the Pilatus aircraft and the AW-139, this is something I, I, I do know. Uh, I do have a little specific knowledge, and these are very successful aircraft and in, a, in, a, in the most modern aircraft, the most modern fleet of its kind, and the largest fleet of its kind anywhere on the, anywhere on the planet. And so we've got, we have r real material to work with. Um, uh, I, I don't foresee any issue at all in reestablishing the credibility. It's very straightforward. Not simple, but it is straightforward, what needs to be done. Um, and, uh, and our board is just committed to doing that. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, your presentation. And thank you very much for, for coming back this afternoon. We appreciate you. that, you rearranging your schedule. I'm available at your pleasure. Hey, thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Thank, thank you. Coming, Mr. <clears throat> Her last presenter today is uh, Kathy Warden, Chief of Staff of the Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. drive down through the cities and towns of North America, though I drive down one week and it's a share and hotel, and I drive down the next week and it's become uh, another hotel and another hotel. Well, you can get a chance. It wasn't the Sheridan. It was the Sheridan. Sheridan. No, it's Sheridan or not. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Yes. So just to, to confirm, uh, you've received the witness appearing before Standing Committee on Public Accounts. That's correct, information. I have, Thank yes. You. And the clerk will swear an oath then. So if you just raise your hand, Ms. Borden. Uh, do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. And the uh, NDP gets to go first this time? I do oh, have sorry. a statement. Oh, sorry. Five minutes statement, Thank and you. then the NDP will go first. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Public Accounts Committee. I would like to provide a brief opening statement, and then I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. My name is Kathy Warden, and I currently hold the position of Chief of Staff to the Minister of Economic Development and Innovation. From April 2010 until November 2011, approximately 19 months, I was honored to work for the Premier of Ontario as a policy advisor. In my role as policy advisor, I had several areas of policy responsibility. Transportation and transit, infrastructure, economic development and trade, research and innovation, and intergovernmental affairs. My duties as a policy advisor included providing the Premier with strategic policy advice regarding the policy areas for which I was responsible, liaising with other offices here at Queen's Park, outside stakeholders, and different levels of government, and on occasion, I was required to travel with the Premier. I reported to the Premier's Principal Secretary, and on occasion, would report to other senior staff, including the Chief of Staff and our Director of Policy. Regarding the January 2011 document from Orange, I would like to make the following observations. 
I have no recollection of receiving the January 2011 document from Orange. I had many areas of policy responsibility while working in the Premier's office, and health policy and Orange, as an organization, were not part of them. My only association with Orange and the Orange document of January 2011 is that I was CC'd on a document that was addressed to the Ministry of Health and did not fall under my areas of responsibility. After seeing my name in the paper several weeks ago regarding the Orange document, I did a search of my documents and email records. While I have no recollection of receiving the Orange document, my records show that I sent an email to my colleagues in the Premier's office on January 31st, 2011. The email simply indicates that we had all received the same document. Finally, I had no further contact with anyone on this document. The document was addressed to the Ministry of Health and the Minister has taken action. I would be happy to answer any questions you have for me. Thank you, and now it's the time for the NDP to ask questions, friends. All right, um, you, um, you saw that you were copied on this document. You've now seen everything that has come about with Orange. Looking back on this document and on the role that you played, why do you figure you were copied? I, I can't speak to the intention of the individuals who wrote that document and who sent it. That's not something that I can speak to. I'm here to speak to the facts that I know and am aware of, and that's not something that I can speak to. You would have to ask the people who sent that document. So you have no idea? Again, I can speak to what I know in terms of I'm asking facts. you your ideas. I understand. I think you're asking me a, a hypothetical question. Uh, and as I stated in my opening statement, health policy and Orange as an organization were not part of my responsibilities. You're not helping yourself here. I'm asking you, do you have any ideas why you were CC'd on this letter in January? Perhaps, Council, this is the sort of thing that we can seek your advice on the, the appropriateness of that question. So it's not a question of the law, so uh, the, you sure, as a witness can answer what you Absolutely. feel comfortable with, and if you have a question of our counsel, feel free to ask. So, I understand the intent of the question, so I, I don't know why I was CC'd. Uh, the only thing I can surmise, and I know that my current Deputy Minister, Wendy Tilford, uh, was here earlier today, and there were some trade missions. I can only surmise that that might be the only reason, but I can't speak to the intent. As I noted in my opening statement, health policy and Orange as an organization weren't part of my responsibilities. I had had no dealings with Orange as an organization previously at all. Um, so that was my first interaction, being CC'd on a document that was addressed to the Ministry of Health. Do you know anybody at Orange? No, I do not. You don't know anybody? Okay. Have you been contacted uh, by anybody from, uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Alfred Apps. Has he ever contacted you regarding the Orange? No, I have no recollection of any contact from him on Orange. No. The, uh, have you ever spoken to the Premier about Orange? I have not. Not since the scandal came out, n not never? I have not. Okay, that's all for me. Thank uh, you. Have you had any contact with Alfred Apps in general, just in general terms? No, I, d I don't know him. Okay. Um, and at any point in time, were you aware of, of Orange and its for-profit kind of schema or schemata in terms of corporate organization? I was not. The first instance was when I saw things in the media and specifically with my name associated with the document. Okay. And in, in the Premier's office, are you aware in general when this issue, uh, the issue of Orange came up? Uh, no. So I, I would state I'm no longer in the Premier's office. I'm now the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Economic Development and Innovation. And, uh, and no, when I was in the Premier's office for my time there, I had no discussion about Orange. Okay. Um, 
so, I mean, it's fair to say that when you receive that email, you were CC'd, you don't recall it per se. You sent out a letter or an email on January 31st. Correct. And who did you send that, that out to? I sent that to uh, the principal secretary, the premier's health policy advisor, and the assistant to the principal secretary. Okay. Would you be able to table that, that email, uh, that correspondence? Yes, absolutely. I don't have it here with me today, okay. but absolutely. Yes. Okay, certainly. And, um, and, and why did you choose those people to send the email off to? Uh, I'm, I can't, so again, I'll go back. I actually don't recall receiving the document, but yeah. if I had to think of my mindset, um, perhaps I looked at who was also on cc on that document, and those would have been my colleagues at the time in the Premier's office that were also included. Okay. Um, that's what I can imagine my, my okay. headspace was. And, and sorry, who was the health policy advisor? Uh, it's an individual named Dan Carbon at the time. Okay. Um, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Very well. Uh, on to the uh, government. No questions? Okay, very well. And uh, for the uh, opposition, Mr. Roulette. <laughs> I see we're getting questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, not for this particular, not for this individual, no. Um, Um, did you have any involvement with the trip to the Middle East or the trips that were brought forward in the past? I did not. You did not. So there was no involvement at all or the, even the, um, the, uh, um, the air show that took place as well? I did not. Okay. Um, do you have, and I believe uh, you mentioned, um, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned your deputy was here earlier on, any expenses that may have been occurred um, by individuals within the minister's office regarding the trips abroad um, that involved uh, going to the Middle East and that. So we would uh, hope that you might be able to force that information. Do you understand I'm what so I'm sorry, asking? no, I didn't understand the question. Okay, uh, the trips that went to the Middle East that the deputy spoke of earlier on. Yes. Um, can we get uh, copies of the expenses of the individuals who are in attendance from your ministry uh, or from the minister's office to be uh, brought forward so that we may be able to review those and the possibility of any actions that may have occurred at that time. Uh, so to the chair and to the member, I can absolutely speak with officials and, um, and endeavor to do that. I have no problem making that request, of course. Um, have you or any of your uh, staff met with the officials from uh, Augusta Westland? Uh, so the, you, the honorable member would know that staff uh, and the minister, et cetera, have changed uh, since the previous election. So what I can tell you is that I have not met with uh, any of the members of the company. I think the deputy was here earlier and provided uh, details on that. I couldn't speak to that. And um, I don't believe any of my current staff in the minister's office have met with the company. We've had no interaction with them. Okay, so you have... From, uh, from your recollection, nobody in your current staff have uh, had those. And were you aware of any previous staff members who had those meetings as well? Would with any, the company? Uh, with the, yes. Uh, no, again, I can't speak to it. Um, I think the deputy provided information. I'm sure she and members of the previous minister staff could give details, but I, I can't. I don't know when they met, who they met, if they met. Okay. I apologize. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if my colleagues have questions. Uh, so no, Mr. Please. Chair, I have no questions for this witness. So I think we have some motions, and I'd uh, defer the time uh, to get that business done. Very good. Thank you very much okay. for coming before Thank the you. committee Thank you. today. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the first motion we have is one from uh, from uh, Liz Sandals. So you would like uh, me to read it into the record, Chair? Yes, please. Uh, that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts direct the clerk of the committee to request the attendance of the following individuals as witnesses in relation to the committee's consideration of the 2012 Special Report of the Auditor General of Ontario on Orange Air Ambulance and Related Services. The Member of Provincial Parliament for Oshawa, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Whitby Oshawa, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Simcoe North, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Dufferin Caledon, and the Member of Provincial Parliament for Nickel Belt. Okay, any uh, discussion on that? Debate? France? Am I in a conflict of interest to vote? Oh, good question. Good question. 
Just give us a second here. The clerk's thinking. How are you going to vote anyways? We'll vote for it. Yeah, that's... We're just going to recess for one minute so he can check. Uh. Anyway, so I'm just going to abstain just in case, and my colleague will vote for it, and that'll be the end of that. Okay, that's 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 How's fine. That? So, any other comments? Okay. Well, could you, uh, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Go ahead. That the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, so Ms. Sandals moved that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, the committee direct the clerk of the committee to request the attendance of the following individuals as witnesses in relation to the committee's consideration of the 2012 special report of the, of the Auditor General of Ontario on Orange Air Ambulance and Related Services, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Oshawa, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Whitby Oshawa, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Simcoe North, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Dufferin Caledon and the Member of Provincial Parliament for Nickel Belt. Uh, Mr. Go Chair, ahead, Frank. Uh, I'm prepared to uh, support that uh, with on the proviso uh, that the Member agrees that we add the Premier to that list. So that would have to be an amendment to the motion. So that will have to be a separate motion. Yeah. No, I move an amendment to that. Okay, so that's fine. So <laughs> that's the amendment. Then could okay. you please produce that in writing? Yes, gladly. Sir, I'll uh, read my record, amendment. Please. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Please. Uh, I uh, propose the following amendment: uh, that the premier be added to the list of MPPs to be requested to attend as a witness to the committee hearings. Okay, and we'll have we'll need to take a uh, a short recess, two to five minutes, to get this. Uh, Printed. Okay. Please. Amendment, if I may. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I think it's my motion. Mr. Zimmer has an amendment. I misspoke. Oh, yeah, Mr. Zimmer has decided to make an so, amendment. So, just, uh, I've got to speak with my subcommittee member. Okay. Okay. Move this amendment. To his to, amendment. To the amendment, to Mr. Cleese's amendment. Okay. So that's uh, tit for tat. That the leader of the official opposition and the leader of the third party be added to the witness list. We'll need... We'll need that in writing. We'll need that in writing. He moved to the member of the third party. You start the chair. You 
this. <coughs> Do we need to get this printed? Yeah, so we need to, so, take, so we need to take another recess to get this printed. on the record and uh, we are now adjourned. <laughs>